friends. Welcome in. Uh, welcome to Coding Garden. <laughs> Today uh, is a stream at a time of day I don't normally stream. Uh, but this is fun. I see a lot of new faces, a lot of people that I haven't seen in a long time. So I appreciate you all being here. Yeah, welcome in, K-Weekman. Glad to have you. Uh, we're going to be trying to answer questions today. I'm going to be doing my best. Also, I have my space heater on. Let me stop talking. Tell me if you can hear the background noise. Test. Can you hear anything? Barely? All right, I'm going to leave it on. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to leave it on here. Yeah, space heater. So it's like a spaceship. I, I, don't, I was going to try to come up with a joke. I don't have a joke for that. But that's just, the, that's just what we call... <laughs> like a small little heater, uh, chill white noise. I mean, the thing is, I typically it's, it looks like this sort of, sort of. <laughs> um, yeah, going to space. keep doing this hand motion. I don't know why. Welcome in, everybody. Glad to have you. This is the Coding Garden. Uh, we're going to hang out today and answer some questions. So um, all of the questions that I answer will be, uh, you can ask. <laughs> I forgot how to speak today. If you want to ask a question in the chat, you can do exclamation mark ask, followed by your question, and it will show up on this website. And I will do, I will do my best to answer that question. Um, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and, and I, I ran a poll because someone in the chat asked, like, are people here just, like, learning? Are people, do people have a job? I mean, uh, this is, like, just a small sampling of the chat so far. If you want to take this poll, you can. Um, but it looks about 56% of, of people that have taken the poll are, em, are employed as a coder. 32% are learning, 10% are searching, and 3% are just here to have fun. Yeah, I would say self-employed is employed. Yeah, yeah. I mean, if you if you make really employed is I make money writing code. Basically, <laughs> that's what that means. Um, I guess I guess none also could be like yeah. Technically, I have gotten paid to write code in the past, but I'm not doing that right now. I don't know. I could have worded this this poll better as well. <laughs> Hello, everyone. Welcome in. Um, I don't know why I feel off today. I need some water. I definitely need to go get. I need to go get some water. Um, and I need to figure out why I feel so off. Maybe it's because it's the time of day. Like usually, I'm streaming at like ten thirty a.m. and like this is the time I'm ending stream. Now I'm starting stream when I usually end stream. I don't know. I'm gonna go grab some water. Listen to this song while I'm gone. I'll be right back. Uh, also, I could start my, um, this thing. Still writing R to pay the rent. I mean, that's like, that's like data science, data analytics, isn't it? Kiwi, Kiwi fun. Or research of some kind. Um, cool. All right. I'll be right back. I'm back. Um, 
I recently tried to use Flatpak. I think it was trying to, yeah, I tried to install OBS on a Linux machine. It seemed to work well enough. Um, cool. So if you have a question, make sure you do exclamation mark ask, followed by your question. It's going to show up on this website. Um, and you can also go to this website and upvote some of the existing questions. So there are 152 questions sitting here. So if you want to uh, kind of peruse them and you see a question that you like, you can upvote it as well. Um, let us welcome everybody in. Um, let's say hi to everybody. So if you want me to acknowledge you, to say hi to you, you can say hi, hello, hello, hey, yo, cheers, greetings, hi, what's up, what's up, morning, afternoon, evening, howdy, good day, coding, hi, yo, bo, hi, yo, or boga, hey. If your message matches this regular expression, I will say hi to you. Oh, hello. Um, and I thought I fixed my overlay, but some of the icons are still broken. We'll have to fix that another time. Uh, what's up, Mark Boots? Welcome in. Hello, uh, Clipped and uh, Matacolette and uh, Eamon Dife and Ryan and Java Guy and Sharkbull and Itchy and Stas. Glad to see you, Stas. Hopefully you're doing all right. What's up, Pete Pal and America 2050 and Drills and Old School Rapper and Data Costa and DJ Concarne and K Weekman. What's up, Zelino and Peter and Rugmat uh, and C Nikolov and Neon Dactyl and Make It Pies and Hello Alka. What's up, Nullset and UX Web and SQL Gorgster? Welcome in. Welcome in, everybody. Glad to see you. Uh, we're going to do our best to answer some questions. We're also just going to hang out. Today's going to be a chill day. Chill day. What's up, Transmissions? Welcome in. I can't believe you got that Twitch name, Transmissions. Have you had that name for a while? Since 2012. That's 10 years. <laughs> 10 years on Twitch. That's crazy. All right. Uh, let's go ahead and ask, answer some questions. If you have already asked a question, you could do exclamation mark here. The chats will bubble up. Maybe get a beer. You know, it is that time of day. <laughs> Remind me in one hour. In one hour's time, I will go get a beer. Yeah. Okay. Let's answer this one from Excavator that says, uh, what UI framework is your go-to for Vue 3? I've used Unify in the past, but it seems it's still in alpha. I tried Quasar, but I don't really like it. Didn't I already answer this question? Maybe not. Uh, just let me know really quick, Excavator. Did, didn't I answer this question? Maybe I didn't archive it? Maybe I answered it for somebody else. Jigglypuff or Psyduck? Mm, Psyduck. They're both annoying, but Psyduck is less annoying, and I like that Psyduck is a bit of a, a, bit of a basket case. So Psyduck. Psyduck's my answer to that. Uh, okay, no, no worries. I'll, I'll answer your question because uh, we can dive into this really quick. So first off, we'll talk about uh, Vuetify. So it used to be that Vuetify JS was the de facto uh, component library when you were, you were building a, a Vue app. But then this thing called Vue.js 3.0 came along, and it had some breaking changes that Vuetify uh, was, not like, was not immediately able to create a new version of their app that could run against Vue 3. So it took them a, a, a quite a while to create um, a version 3 that actually just released uh, in... Uh, um, wait. They're targeting Q1 2023? Technically, it's, it's stable. Technically, it's stable. But um, uh, all, of, all of that to say that, like... For the longest time, Vue 3 has been out, but you couldn't use Vuetify with it unless you wanted to use the beta or the or the alpha of, of, of Vuetify 3. Um, but now, if you go to next.vuetify.js.com, you can see the Vuetify 3 docs, which have a dark mode. One of, one of the, the nicest new things about Vuetify 3. And so uh, I think this goes along with your, the other question that you had, um, which is, uh, have I checked out Vuetify 3? And I have not. Okay, yeah, so th uh, 3.1 uh, is the next version for Q1 2023. Cool, but they do have a stable release of version 3 that you can access here, and you can install uh, by running this command. Uh, <laughs> I hope not, right? <laughs> Uh, so, uh, have I checked it out? I haven't. I, I need to do a stream where I just try it out. Like, I assume it's going to be about the same. Like, I don't, I don't see... I guess I'll, 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 yeah, I'll probably have to read the upgrade guide to see, like, what has changed. And maybe you can check that out, too, if you have used Vuetify 2. I don't imagine anything is going to be too different. Like, 
uh, really the reason it took them so long to upgrade is because a lot of their internals needed to be upgraded. But the the API surface that consumers of the library um, uh, are using is is very likely e extremely similar. So if you knew if you knew Vutify two, I'm sure you could do Vutify three. But I, I personally haven't tried it yet. Um, so, but yeah, that, that used to be the de facto one. It took them so long. A lot of people moved to other things. Um, some other ones to check out are uh, Prime View. So Prime Faces has component libraries for a lot of other frameworks, but they also have one for Vue. Um, and uh, they have a lot of different themes too, which is pretty interesting. So you, you can use this component library and then you can swap in different themes like a, a dark bootstrap theme, a dark material theme, or a light material theme. I've used this once before. There are some paid features. I think like the theme generator is a paid feature, but other than that, you can use Prime View. Um, and then what else? Yeah, thanks for that link, Drills. What are some other ones? Yeah, and then Quasar is the other one. So, and I have used a little bit of Quasar. Um, I'm glad to hear that, Deceros. Hopefully it's working out for you. Um, React Query is pretty cool. It reduces a lot of your code. <laughs> you write less code with React Query for sure. Uh, but yeah, Quasar is interesting in that uh, this isn't just a component library. Um, this is uh, like a cross-platform toolkit. So you can write one app, b um, bundle it into a desktop app, a mobile app, a progressive web app, a server-side rendered app, a single-page application, a browser extension. You can basically have one code base that does it all. Along with that, they provide components. So you technically don't have to use all of those other features that give you cross-platform support. You actually could just use their component library and then you get material design type components that you could you could use. And this is how I've used Quasar before. Um, I have not uh, used their cross-platform building. That would be cool to try at one point. But I, I uh, just had an existing view app. I installed their component library, just started using it, and, and that's, all I, that's all I've used of it. Um, but that one's pretty cool, and they support View 3. Um, yeah. End of life on View 2? Wow. That'll be interesting to see. Like, do people jump ship? I don't know what they would go to, like Svelte or I don't know. Um, or do they just upgrade? <laughs> Couldn't get to love Quasar. Yeah, and the other thing about choosing Quasar or choosing Beautify is you are choosing material design, and you may or may not want material design. Uh, the other thing to look at is uh, Buf Bufi, which is Bulma for Vue, though I don't know if they support version 3 yet. Um, hey, what's up, Ultrando? Welcome in. Um, I guess we could probably look on their GitHub. Issues. View 3 support has been closed. Yeah, I think I remember reading this issue. Something like they decided that they weren't uh, they weren't going to support it, or if they would did support it, it would be a completely separate library. Um Man, and then this person is just advertising their own library, or is this the creator? Mm, I think this is just their own version of it. Yeah. Yeah, I agree, Ryan. Uh, it's tricky. I don't. I don't think Buify supports Vue three, so that's that's a that's a non-starter. There's also uh, like Bootstrap Vue. I don't know if they have the if that's the exact name of it. Yeah, and let's see. So this supports. View, if we look at view three, with the release of version 2.23, you can now use Bootstrap View with the migration build of view three. Um, this is the build of view three that provides a configurable view two compatible behavior. Whoa, that's cool. Seems like I, I didn't even know this existed, but this seems like this could add support for a lot of uh, older view two apps. Yeah, your mileage may vary. I, I haven't tried this, but um, if you go and look, look through their components and stuff, basically you have bootstrap style components, uh, but they're view components. So if you're into bootstrap, you could use this thing. Uh, and apparently they do support Vue 3, but I personally haven't used it. I don't, I don't know what issues you'd run into with that compatibility layer. 
Cool. Those are all the ones that I know of. You could also look into some of the Tailwind component libraries like Flowbyte. Um, because if you look at Flowbyte, um, they have a Vue version, and I do, do, do believe this supports Vue 3. Um, I thought they had a separate... Yeah, okay. Standalone Vue. This is the one. Flowbyte Vue. Um, so these are Vue components that are using Flowbyte styles. Um, and if you're already using Tailwind in your app, then it might make sense to use something like this, because all of this is based on uh, based on Tailwind. Um, I mean, you, you could use Tailwind by itself, but Tailwind by itself is not a component library. It is a uh, CSS utility library. And we're specifically looking at component libraries. We're looking at, um, uh, for, in the example of Flowbyte, they, they literally used a Tailwind to create this button, but this component library is hiding all those Tailwind classes from you, but it is configurable. Yeah, and thank you for the link drills. I appreciate you. You're like the... I don't know. I appreciate it. <laughs> As I'm talking, you're providing links. It's good stuff. It's good stuff. You settled on Tailwind with Flowbyte for now. Cool, cool, cool. Yeah. I mean, uh, if you like the way Tail, if you like the way Flowbyte looks, and you're already using Tailwind, I think it makes sense. Um, there might be something as well for like some of the other Tailwind UI things, like uh, Daisy UI. Um, I don't. I don't know if they have like a React or a Vue component library. I don't know. You'd have to look into it. Yeah, and then if you're yeah, and if you're in the React world, there's a lot of other options. But we're talking about Vue, so yeah, those are your options. If I had to choose, if you if you told me that I had to choose by tomorrow, I would tell you to just wait longer. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, honestly, I so just to get my opinions on it, I want to try Vueify uh, version three because I haven't done that yet. Um, like I said earlier, though, if you choose Vutify, you're choosing material design. So it's like, do I want the app that I'm building to look like material design? Maybe not. If I didn't want material design, uh, maybe, I'd, maybe I'd try Flowbyte. I don't know. We used a little bit of Flowbyte in the Fresh Spots one. But thank you for your question. Hopefully that helped a little bit. It sounds like you already, you already had, had an answer to your question, but hopefully that helped a little bit. Uh, cool. So if you asked a question, type exclamation mark here. That question will bubble up. Do I think Vutify will be compatible with Tailwind? Could you install both? Oh, you, you definitely could because um, as far as I know, Tailwind doesn't add any CSS reset or uh, anything like that unless you do it. I don't know if it does it by default, but th that's the things you would be up against. It's like a, uh, a CSS reset might... Um, or something like that might conflict with the existing Vutify styles. Um, that's what you would run into. But if you're just bringing in the utility libraries, like the flex classes and the sizing classes and stuff like that, that probably would be fine. Um, what you probably should do is use something like Uno CSS, which is uh, completely Tailwind compatible, but you can pick and choose the things that you want to use. Um, and so something like this would potentially be compatible with it if you really did want to use like utility classes along with the component library. Yeah. Announcements don't show on the overlay. Yeah, I, <laughs> that's a feature we need to add. Um, install, use. Uh, install, I think, is the right word. You had that right, right? I never used Semantic UI. I did hear of it, but I never used it. Yeah. OK. Uh, cool. Let's answer this one from Ryan, longtime Coding Garden fan. <laughs> First time asker. No, I think I've answered questions before. Ryan says, how would you get a GPX route to show up on a Mapbox map? Do you create a layer? Would you have to upload it to Studio as a layer? The Mapbox docs don't really make it clear. Convert to GeoJSON, add it as source, as a layer. That's my that's my answer. <laughs> did you did you eventually did you just eventually figure this out? Um, uh, let's uh, let's for, for for one, let's just look at Mapbox to see what you're what you're even talking about. Yeah, yeah. And also, I don't know if I've ever heard the term GPX. Um, GPX file editor. So a GPX, I'm guessing, is a type of file format that describes a route or a path of GPS coordinates. Is that accurate, Ryan? Um,
Yeah, I would imagine it's like it is some kind of XML format. Um, G it's GeoJSON in XML format. Okay. Yeah, and then if you're not familiar with GeoJSON, this is a, a standard where you can represent uh, uh, geographical things in in JSON format. So it's it's heavily used on maps and stuff like that. So the question they were asking is, they've got this GPX. They want to put it onto a Mapbox ma ma Mapbox Max ma Mapbox Map. How do they do it? Um, the answer is as a layer. So if you look at um, the Mapbox Maps documentation, uh, and, and honestly, it's going to be similar um, for pretty much every mapping library that you use. How do I get to the Mapbox docs? Um, I mean, developers, documentation. <laughs> OK. Um, Mapbox GLJS. I would assume you're probably using this to, to get your map onto the page. Um, and then if we look at examples, um, layers is a pretty common uh, concept, even in like Google Maps or on Leaflet. So you probably want some kind of layer. Yeah, so this example, add a line to a map using a GeoJSON source. That's exactly how I would have figured it out. Okay, how do I convert this GPX to GeoJSON and then start to modify this example so that I can take that converted GeoJSON to get it onto the map. Um, so yeah. Cool, 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 cool. Trying to get dots and clusters to show at further zooms. Disappear and render full routes when you zoom closer. It's a work in progress. Yeah, so I, I've actually done that with Mapbox before. And uh, we, we used an existing uh, example to go from. And, and, and you can, you can, the code example that we went from, we, we had to modify further so we could tweak, like, at what zoom level does the cluster dot expand, that kind of thing. Um, I do believe we found it directly in their documentation. We were using the, um, uh, there was a map, there was a map GL library that was by Uber. I think they changed the name though. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Um. This is it, VizGL. Found it. Found it. Um, uh, they, they, they changed the name. It used to be something like Uber Maps or something like that. Um, but if you look at their examples, I do believe they have, a, yeah, they have this clustering example. And this is what we used as a base, and we just heavily modified it for what we, what we were doing. Um, but uh, you can see, like, when you're out here, the clusters are bigger. As you zoom in, the clusters get smaller and smaller until you get to a certain point when there are no more clusters. Um, yeah. Uh, basically, it's like you have all these dots, but at, when you're at this zoom level, you don't want to see a bunch of dots. You want to know that there are a certain number of dots. So this is the example we used, and we were using specifically that library with Mapbox. But yeah. Yeah. See you later, Excavator. Thanks for hanging out. Uh, what kind of issues you got? Cool. Appreciate that. Yeah. Yeah. I, as far as I know with Mapbox, I mean, I did this, this was probably a year and a half, maybe two years ago when I did it. There wasn't a plugin. Um, we just modified an existing example. And this, the example is just all about layers and then using GeoJSON data. So it was nothing specific to Mapbox, really just like using the, the data that you have in the layers mechanism. So cool. That was a fun little explore, exploration. Thank you for your question, Ryan. And I'm glad you figured it out without me. <laughs> Uh, Mihai Andre asks, what do I think of Nux? Would I use it as a full stack instead of Express plus Vue and Vite? Yeah, I would. So, um, and I tried, I tried starting to build an app with it, but I do believe that uh, Nux, oh, well, I mean, that's not good. Okay, I was about to say, the page is broken. No, they need to fix the link on their homepage. It's it's not a good first sign, but here, let's let's go to a link that works. Here we go. Nux3 is stable. This was literally announced today. Okay. 
great because every time I go to the Nux site, I see that version three was still release candidate. I, I installed the release candidate version. Um, and uh, yeah, that, why are, you, why are you sending a Google link? <laughs> Uh, but I won't mind you just testing. But yeah, yeah. Um, for the longest time, I was really hesitant to use Nux because version three wasn't uh, like a stable release yet. So that's great. We'll have to try this. I mean, they literally just announced the stable version today. Yeah. So um, I'll, I'll definitely have to give it a try on stream. I, I think in general, it's cool. I think it's like because I like Vue a whole lot more than React, Nuxt is the next JS of the Vue world. So it would make sense that I use something like this. Um, the main issue I had when I was trying it out is that I was using the release candidate version. I don't think the documentation at the time had been updated for version three. Um, so I was like, it, it was tricky to figure out the things that I wanted to do. But now that it's stable, um, that uh, do I think Vue is better than React? So better is a loaded word, better in quotes, right? Like. It really depends on uh, like preferences and like how you like to write code. For me personally, when I'm writing React, I have to write a whole lot more code than if I'm writing like in Vue or in um, Svelte. Um, so in general, React requires me to write more code. Also, like the way that I think about solving problems doesn't really align with uh, how hooks work. Um, so it, for me, it's typically an uphill battle when I'm trying to solve something with, with hooks. Um, that's not to say that I, I can't do it. Like I, I've, I've written react code professionally for like over three years. I was teaching react for like two years, two years. Um, I, I, I can probably write better react code than you can, but I don't like it. I don't like it at all. Um, uh, if you look at the frequently asked questions, I have a, there's a section where I, where I talk about, uh, why I like. Uh, view over react and I linked to two videos uh, this one specifically um, overview of view this is like an intro to Vue.js and I'm talking to you as if you already know what react is and how react works and and telling you how view is better in, in all of these ways so if, if you feel like watching that video you, you can um, okay uh, can we can we fix this Nux website um, Let's let's figure this out. Okay, so if, so if you're if you're new to coding, you're you're a newbie, and you're like, hey, I want to contribute to open source. It's very likely that this website is open source, and it's very likely that we can fix this bug because right now when I click here, uh, it's broken. So if somebody hasn't already made a pull request for it, um, we can try and fix it. So nextjs.org is the website. I can see that they have a repo, so this is very likely the code. Um, update link to new OS. Yeah, 27 seconds ago, uh, Tiger just fixed it. <laughs> So that's great. Yeah, basically, um, instead of using a Nux link, this needed to be an app link because it's a full URL. Uh, but they fixed it. They literally fixed it. for. This is the power of open source. They fixed it 40 seconds ago. It'll be curious to see, do they have like CI automation? Is it going to auto-deploy the site if I do like a hard refresh without the cache? Maybe not. Um, yeah, I don't know what their process is for deploying this website. Um, so one of our viewers, I don't know who is Tigar. Who are you? Who are you, Tigar? Probably not. They seem cool. They're too cool for coding guard. <laughs> um, cool. It's not fixed yet. That's fine. So what do I think of it? It's pretty cool. Um, the, the fact that it, it can do uh, server-side rendering and it, and, it, and it does the... No, no, no. I, I mean, I'm just... I'm just. Uh, I'm not attacking the chat. I'm attacking myself. It was a self-deprecating humor. I do not... I see how it came off now. I, I get it. Um, that is not what I meant. I did not meant that you, you all are not cool. That's not what I meant. I meant that I'm not cool. I'm not cool enough for them to watch me is what I meant. Uh. Uh, 
Okay. Um. Oh, thanks, Alka. <laughs> Unfollow and ban. Uh, what's up, Disto? Welcome in. Um. So yeah, Nux seems cool. So the the other thing uh, of um. This always comes to mind because so many people are uh, these days. If you're a React developer, you typically reach for Next.js when you're when you're going to build a five hundred. But we are cool. <laughs> thank you, thank you, Firebolt. Thank you for the bits. You didn't have to do that. Come on, Valk. Come on. Um, what was I going to say? Yeah. So, as Rea React developers these days are typically reaching for. Uh, Next.js, because you get the best of all worlds. You get a single page application when it needs to be. You get it server side rendered when you need it to be. Uh, it's it's hybrid in between. You get statically generated pages. It, it's just smart enough to make the right kind of website based on the code that you wrote. And Nux d does a very similar thing for Vue.js. So it's pretty cool. I need to spend more time with it, especially now that there's a stable release. So yeah. Yeah, so Nuxt is a framework built on top of Vue. So Vue, Vue itself is just a client-side library. So like the Vue library itself doesn't have any opinions about server-side rendering or server-side framework of any kind. Vue.js is purely client-side. So to get that, that server-side piece, uh, Nuxt is a, a framework that was built on top of it. Um, though there actually might be a way of doing server-side rendering um, with Vue itself. Let's see, because you, you could probably do server-side rendering with Vite, Vite in Vue. Um, yeah, there's this create SSR app, but I don't know if it's doing all the smart things that Nuxt is doing. Like, I don't, I don't know, because because this is like purely, purely rendered, <laughs> rendered, purely server-side rendered. Um, yeah, hi, client client hydration is more of what I was thinking of. But it's interesting to see, like, Vue has this entire guide on if you wanted to do that. Um, but they even say use Nuxt or Quasar, or there's also Vite SSR. Yeah. And then Nuxt is a little bit more opinionated. They have, like, file based routing um, and stuff like that. So. It'd be, and honestly, you know, that's like, I mean, I don't know if you're joking, Shalvin, but that would be cool. It'd be cool to rebuild fresh spots with Vue and with Nuxt. I, I would like that. Bowling for soup? Where? <laughs> what, did, what did I miss? I can't play the song because I'll get DMCA'd. What are you saying? I don't know. You'll have to clarify Acid Spark. All right. If you asked a question, type exclamation mark here. Those questions will bubble up. I'll do my best to answer them. Who do I think will be the next 007? I have no idea. I don't, I don't, I don't watch the Bond movies. I don't know. I've maybe seen one of them. I don't. I don't know. I have I have no opinion. Is are there people in the runnings for the next Bond? Yeah. Watch me take watch it take me an hour to do it in next three probably. Oh, my two kids in high school they tell me that I'm uncool. Is that the uh, the cadence of the song? <laughs> you asked that so long ago. It's been on this page for the longest time. Uh, I'll answer this one really quick. Angular, do I think it's still worth it to invest? Does it still have a future? <laughs> You're talking about Angular like it's a stock of some kind. Um, it's a framework. If you like the way they do things, pick Angular, sure. Um, I think it absolutely has a future because like, it's, it's backed by Google, for one. Um, you probably used Google in some way today, you, the person watching this. And uh, it's a large corporation that's backed it, so... Yeah, uh, exclamation mark archive should get rid of that question. Um, so, oh, I, I guess that's true. Investing, yeah. So, I, I see what you're what you're saying. If you're coming from that perspective, right? Like, let's say you're a team lead and you're trying to decide on the tech for the next app that you're going to be working on. You are making an investment. <laughs> you're you're making a, a gamble in a way. I don't. Maybe not a gamble. I don't know. Honestly, like Angular is a pretty safe gamble just because. It's so enterprisey, right? I don't. It's made a lot of decisions for you, so you don't have to worry about all of that. I don't know. I'm not plugged into the Angular ecosystem or anything like that, so I don't know like what's on the horizon or what they're changing and stuff like that. But I, but I do know that Angular is like an an enterprise framework, so that's true as well, Stas. So you do have to consider that that 
uh, stuff at Google does it doesn't stick around. Not all, not everything sticks around forever. So it is possible that they would like sunset this, but uh, I don't know. I'm not the person to ask honestly because I don't use it. I don't know if we have any any uh, Angular users and experts in the chat, but from an outside perspective, it seems fine. It's it seems like the safe choice, I guess, just because everything is just built in. I don't know. Uh, old school rapper has a question. Wait, is your name old school crapper? And I've been calling you old school crapper all this time. <laughs> Is that right? Is that right? Is that right? Yes. Well, I'm going to keep calling you old school rapper. <laughs> Do I have any ideas to save the world with code? No. Um, I'll think about that for a second. Angular is the old grumpy guy at work. No one likes to talk to, but knows all the secrets and tricks to solving certain problems. Yeah, yeah. Um, no, I guess that's the thing is like, like, how, how do you save the world? Right? Like what, what's wrong with the world? I mean, personally, like in, in my life recently, and I, and I'm trying, when I'm, when I'm thinking about what is wrong with the world and how I would hope humans would improve, um, it mainly has to do with just how, uh, uh, selfish a lot of people are, how, oblivious people are to the the people the people around them how how people do things in in public places where they don't take into account um uh the people around them and i guess selfish is the easiest way to, to talk about that yeah people lack empathy um i i definitely think it got worse after the pandemic i i think um people so I, I, I'm built different, okay? So like, I, I am a homebody. The pandemic like barely affected me at all because I stay home all the time anyways. And so like the, the, the way I acted out in the world didn't really change. Not, not, not much changed for me. But for a lot of people, it was like a rude awakening, right? So for a lot of people, they were so used to being physically around people so much that when they couldn't do that for a very long time, they were stuck at home. The only way they interacted with people was through video calls or like online gaming or uh, yeah, basically that like digital ways of interacting. Um, they lost all of the etiquette that they had when they were used to being in person. And for a lot of people, it seems that they, they didn't get that back for whatever reason. And, and, the, and where this manifests for me is when I'm driving, the other drivers on the road lack empathy. Uh, when I'm walking around in a store or in a grocery store, the other people lack empathy. Um, when I'm walking on a sidewalk, people lack empathy. Basically, the ways you would interact with strangers in the world. As I've been doing that lately, it's very frustrating because most people seem to lack empathy and seem to be uh, not care at all about the people around them. So how do I save them with code? I don't know. I don't know. I don't have an answer to this. I'm just, I'm just ranting. <laughs> Yeah, no, I and I, I believe that same thing, uh, BT Bap. It's like, I think people were already on the verge of of of, of these kinds of things, but there, certain events happened that made people realize, like, oh, I don't have to obey traffic laws because police aren't around all the time. Oh, like I don't have to be nice because there are no consequences. Like, uh, there's there's a lot of things that caused people to um, basically take the the niceties, the, um, uh, what do you, what do you call it? The, um, basically like you, you don't have to be a good person. Like you don't have to be nice, but it's a whole lot better for everyone around you if you are nice. Right. And people realize that they don't have, to, I guess they don't have to fake it. Right. Cause most people were already, were probably already bad, bad people to begin with. And now they realize that they don't have to fake it anymore. I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> I'm going to stop talking about this. I don't have any ideas to save the world. Honestly, I would want to spend a lot. Of, I wouldn't want to spend some time in uh, maybe in a, in another country where uh, maybe like a third world country or a country that hasn't been as technologically advanced as uh, the United States, because 
uh, the types of solutions that people are coming up with in like third world countries and places where they have less, less access to internet, less access to electricity, they're much more innovative solutions that I think the rest of the world could benefit from. So I'd like to spend some time there and, uh, and in various places and, and, and then come up with some ideas. So come to Brazil, I'd be, I'd be happy to. I need to go on a world tour. Probably, I'd probably do like a bicycle tent, like bicycle camping tour um, and uh, visit lots of places. Humanity should be more humble and waste less. I agree. I agree. Yeah, it, but you have to think about, like, there's there's something to that, Freddie, right? It's like a like shorter lifespan, but is it because, like, less access to food? Uh, honestly, it's probably, like, less access to clean water. Um, there are certain, and I'm not saying that they've figured everything out. I'm just saying that there's a lot of problems they face that need solving that we we never face those problems in, in a like, a, a first world country. I don't know. I say first world because that also just seems very, like, elitist <laughs> to say that, like, our world is better than your world. I don't know. Crypto mining alone will raise the world's temperature by two degrees. What's an Itchy Boots tour? Am I going to regret searching this? The Netherlands? Please clarify. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, Therantex. We try to keep things mostly safe for work here. <laughs> All right, let's answer another question. Um, uh, Peepal asked a question three minutes ago. Any opinion on Axios versus Fetch? What are the pros and cons? All right, let's 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 try our best to make a YouTube video. We have not made a YouTube video in a very long time. Um, and I'm going to do my best. I'm going to set myself a... Uh, let's do a 30, 30 minute timer to write all of my thoughts down, come up with what I'm going to talk about, um, and then record my, my, my rant in one take. <clears throat> Content. <laughs> okay. Uh, Axios versus Fetch. So first of all, what is Fetch? Um, and in talking about that, we'll also talk about uh, what did we do before Fetch? Um, and then we'll talk about uh, what is Axios? Um, well, I mean, <laughs> I'm going to do my best to do it in one take, but we'll see. Um, when should I use Axios, or when should I use Fetch over Axios? I guess there's another question we're going to answer. Um, yeah, well, also, yeah, so what it, yeah, yeah, yeah. What, what is Ajax? Um, and then, yeah. Cool. Yeah, so like Axios came about uh, um, way, way before like Fetchup was ever, ever created. Um, what about like other HTTP clients? Sure. I mean, I'll just mention that. Um, cool. All right, so I'm gonna do my best to like write notes on this and run run through these questions, um, and then I'm gonna do that once, and then I'm gonna take a step back, and um, uh, perform it for for a YouTube video. So like I get I get one shot at <laughs> doing all of this. Um, and there's an ad that is about to start, so. Um, I'll pause. I won't even get into this until the ad is over. Um, but before that ad starts, if you sub with Prime, you will not see an ad. So 
I've got 10 seconds to sub with Prime. <laughs> um, let's see, is there a Wikipedia page on uh, Ajax? <laughs> or, yeah, you could, uh, I mean, you could also have, just have Twitch Turbo. I'm okay with that, too, because then that's just less people complaining about ads. Um, well, it, it's an ad break. It's an, a minute, a two-minute ad break. Is Ajax still around? I mean, yes. <laughs> yeah. I, we don't call it, but I, I mean, honestly, it's been a while since I've even heard anyone call it this. Um, but it is absolutely still a thing. It is still how web pages are able to show dynamic content without a full page refresh. Uh, I did know that, Bob, but other people might not know that. You can subscribe for free with Twitch Prime. If you just click that link, um, you can see if you have your Prime sub available. And um, you can sub. Oh, wow. Uh, I mean, there were only... 10 people that voted in this poll. I think people are biased because they watch me <laughs> and I use Axios, but I'm going to give you the reason why why I use Axios in a second. Um, also, just a little self-plug. I have a YouTube channel if you'd like to go follow over there. I also have a Twitter where I, where I uh, tweet when I go live if you don't want to miss it. I also have a mailing list where I send out uh, an email every time I go live if you don't want to miss it. And we have a Discord where, I'll sit, where I send notifications as well. Yeah, you can also check out my personal channel. Um, there's a whole lot of snow headed to uh, this part of the world. So probably, I, I want to do an IRL walking stream, I think on Friday. So on Friday, I don't follow myself? No, I do. I'm following. <laughs> but on Friday, I probably am going to do an IRL stream over on my W3CJ account. Um, uh, in the snow. It's going to be like a foot of snow, so it'll be fun. Yeah, snowing garden. <laughs> All right, we're back from the ad break. Uh, let's talk about this. So AJAX stands for Asynchronous JavaScript and XML. Um, it is a, a technique in building web pages that allows JavaScript to make requests to external resources and uh, to then use those resources on the page, and it does not require a page refresh. Now, if you're used to the web these days, um, you're very familiar with this. Even you may not even may, may not even realize it, um, but uh, like for example, when I load this web page, you see that loading spinner. The the page itself loads very quickly because um, there's just some HTML, and like the base of the page loads. Um, and actually, if I show in the network tab here, um, I can slow it down, and that'll prevent the um, the initial data from from loading so if I refresh this page um, you'll see this loading spinner um, and it's just gonna sit there until we actually get the data but the page itself has already loaded now JavaScript has is kicking in to actually make the HTTP request um, and honestly this might not be the best example because I think yeah it's actually using web sockets behind the scenes it's not even using um, uh, <laughs> like an HTTP request, but you could imagine that this list of questions uh, was coming across as um, an HTTP request, and then that would actually um, do that. Yeah, yeah, that, that's that'd be a good one, wouldn't it, uh, Drill? So if I go to coding.garden slash videos, um, uh, technically the data is cached, but let me um, let me clear the the local storage cache and everything, and then. Um, um, you can see it in action. There we go. Cleared it. And then in the network tab, we're going to bring this down to 2G. Clear it. Refresh it. So, uh, when the page loads, you can see, so all of the, the, the actual code for the page has already loaded. Behind the scenes, it is making an HTTP request to actually get that list of videos. Uh, and in this case, it's getting those videos um, 
as a, as a big old array of JSON data. But the moment the page loads, all of the, the content of the page, the JavaScript, the CSS, the HTML, all of that is already loaded. And then behind the scenes, it's making a request to get the data. Once it has the data, it loads it into the page as these, these video thumbnails. That is um, asynchronous JavaScript and XML. Now, the term uh, is, is outdated because these days, uh, APIs aren't just serving up XML. A lot of APIs are serving up JSON data. And specifically, that's what we're dealing with here. So this request was made out um, to um, this endpoint, which is an API that just returns the list of all videos on my uh, Coding Garden YouTube channel and my Coding Garden Archive YouTube channel. Um, so. Uh, Ajaz, yeah. So we still we still say Ajax, but uh, just know that it's it's an older term because it used to be like XML was the main data format that was used on the web. Um, but now these days, JSON data. So this is if we look at raw data, this is actually what's coming across the wire is uh, this JSON encoded data. So uh, that is Ajax, a syn synchronous JavaScript and XML. It allows us to write JavaScript code that makes requests for resources and then can add them to the page dynamically without fully refreshing the page. So that is a mechanism of pretty much all websites that we use these days. Now, what did we do before Fetch existed? Uh, there's literally an API uh, in the browser called XML HTTP request. Um, and I'll show an example of it, and we'll call that specific API with it. Um, so this this is an, an API that's returning JSON data. We can show some code examples on, on how we can call that. The first code example, uh, we will use XML HTTP request. Um, let me create a folder for this. And then inside of there, we'll create our index.html. Um, have a basic little template. Uh, we'll put XML HTTP request in here. And um, I'll add myself a script, point it at an app.js file, and then we'll create one right here. HTTP request? <laughs> Wait, what? <laughs> Um, did I spell it wrong? Um, Pre-request? <laughs> My brain just refused to remember XML HTTP request and asked me to thank it. Yeah, honestly, I'll say this. When I was getting started with like JavaScript programming, even as someone that already had like several years of like des desktop programming experience, for the life of me, I, I just couldn't wrap my mind around XML HTTP requests. Um, and uh, I actually used, uh, I mean, we can talk about this because I used uh, jQuery Ajax. And that made a lot of sense to me um, because it used the deferred API, which is like the precursor to promises. Um, but let's see if MDN has a good example on how to use XML HTTP request. HTTP request <laughs> um, using H XML HTTP request. Yeah, look at this. It's so clunky. It's so clunky. Um, but we'll show an example of it. So uh, right here, we're going to use this thing, XML HTTP request. So this is built into all web browsers. Um, what I'm going to show is we don't really use this anymore because we have better better ways of doing it. But this is the way we used to, we used to do it. Um, I'm just going to. Uh, Throw in a, a function. Let's see what, what, what I get access to here. OK. Um, so what we're saying here is I want to make a git request against a URL. In this case, I want to make against a git request against this resource, which is going to return some, some JSON data. I'm going to send that request, and then when that request is finished, this function is going to run. Um, let's see what happens. So uh, right now, this HTML file doesn't have any content. Um, I guess what we'll do is we'll just have a div, give it an ID of results. And for now, it'll just say loading. Um, and behind the scenes, we're making this request. And then when we get back the request, we're, we're logging out what we get access to. Uh, let's see what happens. So we're going to go into that folder. Um, 
I'm going to start up this thing called a light server, which is just an, a static file server, but it auto refreshes when files change. Um, so this gives me back uh, an array that has a single object with a load property. Um, return value, source element. I really just want to get access to the body of the response. Um, this is saying this dot response text is if that's the only way that's really weird um, but if it's not hopefully there's another way of doing it uh, if I do response type array buffer okay so actually it is just uh, it is instead of using rec I'm mean, sorry instead of using this we can use rec dot response text here we go this is it so there we go, we got back the data. But you'll notice this is just a string. This isn't actual, uh, this isn't a JavaScript object yet uh, because uh, this doesn't handle that. We, basically, we get back the, re the response body, which is just text. And if we actually want to use that as JSON, we have to parse it. So here we can say um, the JSON is capital JSON.parse and then pass in the response text. So capital J JSON.parse, that's another thing that's built into web browsers. There's also json.stringify, but this is a way of taking some text and turning it into an actual JavaScript object. So now, now um, we have ourselves the actual data that we got back. And, and if we want to add it to the page, that has nothing to do with XML, page, XML HTTP requests. Um, uh, but we'll, we'll just do this anyway. So this gives us each video. Um, we're going to build up a big HTML string. Um, and then for every single um, video, we'll do HTML, we'll append just a paragraph tag with the title of the video inside of it. So this will just be video dot something. Um, video dot snippet dot title. I like that, Disto. We'll, we'll put it in an anchor tag. Good call. So uh, I'm going to put it in a, a paragraph tag. And then inside of that, I'll have an anchor tag that actually links to the YouTube video uh, with that title. Um, um, I'm not logging the JSON anymore. Don't forget the kappa. <laughs> uh, let's see. OK. Uh, we have this. We have snippet dot you know this is gonna be tricky because if uh, oh no no it doesn't matter as long as I can get the the video ID yeah so resource ID dot video ID so um, snippet dot resource ID Dot video ID. So that gives us that, and then we just need to go to youtube.com slash watch v equals that. Video dot snippet dot resource ID dot video ID. Cool. And then um, uh, when we click this, we want to open it in a new tab, and we want to make sure that that new tab. Uh, doesn't know uh, who clicked this link, and also doesn't have it doesn't send any tracking data. Okay, uh, so that's our HTML, and then I'm just going to set this as the the contents of uh, results here. So I'm going to select the results element. So I'll say uh, document dot query selector um, the element with ID results. And I'm going to set its inner HTML to be that big old HTML string that I just built up. Yeah, so this dollar sign um, is uh, how we get access to a variable inside of a string. So this is known as a template string. Let's see if we can find it on MDN. Uh, is it no refer? Yeah, I think you got that right. No referrer. Thank you, uh, Tonka Twuck. <laughs> That's a funny name. Uh, uh, template string. Template literal? Yeah, I'll give you some resources on it. Template literals. 
So this is a newer type of string in JavaScript uh, that uses backticks. But you can do this, which allows you to actually like put an expression or put a variable value inside of that string. Yeah, it's pay. Yeah, you gotta pay. You gotta pay for this code. <laughs> Money code. All right, uh, this should do it. So, basically, what happens is when the page loads, we make a git request to that URL. When we get the data back, this function runs. We parse it as JSON. That gives us an array. We iterate over that array to build up an HTML string, and then we set it on the page. Now, if we did it right. There we go. We have, we have ourselves, it take, I mean, and it's pretty quick too. But you can see now we have a bunch of links and if I click on one, it takes me to a YouTube video. Great, <laughs> that's, a, that's a funny thumbnail. <laughs> I haven't been changing the thumbnails that YouTube automatically picks for my archive channel. This is like the, the feels good man uh, thing. Um, so, but, but we've done it. So basically, uh, if you were to look at the source code of this web page, it's just HTML. It's just this JavaScript. It's not the actual data that we're requesting. But when the page loads, um, then JavaScript kicks in to actually make the request and add the data to the page. Um, and let's actually, to, to demonstrate that, let's even, um, let's not do it immediately. We'll say once we get the data back, uh, wait two seconds before actually setting it on the page. So. Um, now it'll say loading for two seconds, and then after two seconds, finally we see the data. But uh, this is it. All right, this is XML, XML HTTP request. This is how we made requests like this before um, Axios, or I mean, before or even before Fetch. The other thing is jQuery AJAX. So this is something I used for a very long time. Uh, let's create another folder to show this as an example uh, jQuery AJAX. Um, that's how my ancestors made requests. It's so funny to think about because it's like it wasn't that long ago, but yeah, I mean, there's a lot of new devs that'll literally never, literally let never write code like this just because like fetch exists. Um, but yeah, it's really funny. Okay. Yeah, and so I mean, we're we're combining the old school with the new school, right? Because I'm using arrow functions, I'm using template literals, I'm using const and let uh, with this much older API. But that is a thing. OK, so let's go find. Um, and actually, I do want to I'll have this as a link here as a resource. jQuery and Bootstrap is, I mean, if you want to, honestly, <laughs> like we could have added. Oh, actually, you know, you know what we could do? We could add Pico CSS to the page to give it some basic styles. Let's just do that really quick to show you how cool this is. Um, So this looks like this. And then if I go in um, and I add a link to this style library, now it looks like that, which is a little bit better. Honestly, if we put these, I think if we put these in articles, it'll automatically add a card for us instead of a P tag. So now they're, um, now they're cards. Yeah, and then we could even add an image. We're not gonna, we're not gonna get that complex, but yeah, Pico CSS is cool. Um, it's it's kind of like Bootstrap, but you don't have to use any of the classes. Everything just automatically gets applied. Um, yeah. Well, I think that's the thing, right? Drills like all I had to do was add. I mean, I think that's the other thing. It's like I'm trying to isolate the example so that it's just what I want to demonstrate. But all I have to do is add one style shoot, and it looks good. Um, yeah, if, if you're saying what I think you are, Stas, it's like, I kind of want to create my own Pico CSS too. Like, I want to <laughs> like come up with the, my own default styles and then just add that to all of the apps where I don't care about having um, uh, custom styles. Okay, let's keep moving. Uh, next up is jQuery Ajax. Um, I think I literally just have to add jQuery to the page. Give me jQuery. Download. Um, using jQuery with a CDN. Code.jQuery.com. jQuery 3. Minified. Here we go. So, um, this is how our ancestors made HTTP requests. It's not, it's not very nice. Like, you, you do this, you say send, you 
uh, add a listener for load, and when it's ready, you can actually do the thing. jQuery Ajax was really nice because it hid all of the all of that from us and made it so that it was like much less cumbersome to actually make make HTTP requests. Um, let's take a quick stretch. Now for the other type of dollar sign. You're totally right, K Weekman. We're going to show you another dollar sign, but it's a different dollar sign. Um, yeah, it's a different dollar sign. Okay, so this is a, a, a totally separate app. So that, that one that I just wrote, separate file, this is brand new. We're starting from scratch. We start with a base template. We're going to give it a title, uh, jQuery Ajax. Um, we're going to add a script reference to jQuery. So what this does is this brings in the jQuery code to my page so that if I were to add my own little script right here, I now, inside of this file, have access to all of the code that jQuery provides. Uh, and jQuery provides a lot of things, not just jQuery Ajax, but all I'm going to show is jQuery Ajax. Um, we're going to do a similar thing where we have a div and we give it an ID of results. And then we'll also do the similar thing where we add the, uh, the style sheet here. So that goes there. Um, now, in app.js, we want to make a request to this URL. If I do dollar sign dot get, I think, <laughs> is, that an, is that a thing? I'll have to look this up. So if we go to um, the jQuery Ajax documentation, uh, oh no, it's dollar sign dot Ajax, dollar sign dot Ajax. Yeah, that's it. So if I do dollar sign dot Ajax, I can pass in some options like URL, and um, in this case, URL is going to be that same URL to get that data. Um, and then I think if I say, there's something like if I say JSON, it'll automatically parse it for me. We'll figure that out in a second. Um, And they also have a defer the deferred API. So actually, yeah. So I can do dot done. This is this is a nice little a nice little API. So when that's done, give me that data. I'll call it JSON for now. Let's see what we get though. Let's see what happens. So uh, now I'm going to go into the jQuery Ajax one, run it in the same way. That's so, look how easy that was. Wow, jQuery Ajax, so cool. Cool, okay, yeah, so uh, that worked. Let's try this uh, field of kush. Let's see if we can, um, if we can do, uh, if dot get actually is an alias. Yeah, it is, sweet. So. Uh, look at look at these two two bits of code in comparison. Um, uh, split open to the side is what I wanted. Um, well, we're not done yet because really what we need is uh, this little bit of code right here. Like this this little bit of code is always going to be the same. Honestly, we can pull that into a shared function. Let's let's do this. Um, I'm just going to create a file called uh, add videos to page.js. And this just has a function called add videos to page, takes in the videos, and then does this um, videos.for each. Yeah, so this function is is the thing that's going to be the same no matter what we use because it's just taking the data and then adding it to the page. Um, so I'm gonna put that in there. Uh, right now, I need to copy and paste it into both because um, I mean, I guess technically we can have. You know what? We're gonna have a a, a root file that links to all of the others. Yeah, I mean, that's the other thing is like if if I yeah, we could do like imports, but now here's what we're gonna do. We're gonna put it at the root here, and then this one can reference app.js relatively, relative, um, 
And okay, we're gonna make it more complex. We're gonna give this a type of module so that we can just straight up do an import. But um, bear with me. Let me let me fix all of this, and then I'll tell you what I what I did. Um, and now this can say export function add videos to page. Great. Um, so if we go back to the XML HTTP request example. Here we would say uh, import add videos to page from um, add videos to page.js like that because it we should request it from the root um, and then right here we say add videos to page with the JSON um, and then here we want to have a list of links to all of the different pages. Ajax examples. We have ourselves an unordered list. We have ourselves a list item. Uh, this says XML HTTP request. And then that's going to link over to the XML HTTP request page. And then we'll also have the one for jQuery Ajax. All right, let's see if this works. What did I do there? Oh, this just needs its own uh, list item. OK, so if we go here. Um, I can't use light server anymore because it is, uh, I guess I do want the trailing slash on there. Light server is doing a thing where it like, uh, it, it re redirects to the, um, to the root. Can I disable that? Honestly, yeah, I just won't use light server. I'll use a uh, HTTP server uh, like this. And then, um, well, this doesn't auto refresh. It's fine. It's fine. Everything is fine. Because now if I go here, we see it works great. <laughs> and now if I go here, it doesn't work because we need to import that function. All right, let me tell you what I just did. So basically now, um, uh, we have ourselves uh, a, we a website that has multiple folders. So the home page is just going to link to each one of these examples. And then each one of those examples is going to import this function, because this is the, the functionality that's the same no matter what. Um, so here, we imported that function. When we got back the data, we call it. And so similarly, we need to uh, import this function here. And then when we get back the data with jQuery, we can say add videos to page JSON. Uh, we do need to make sure we have a div with ID results. We do. So now if I refresh the jQuery Ajax page, it works the same way. Um, but now we can um, more clearly compare, compare the two. So the right-hand side, the really, really old way of doing this. Um, I guess that's true, DJ Concarne, but uh, we're only we only have jQuery on that one example, um, but yeah. So this creates an instance of XML, XML HTTP request. Says get that URL. When it gets back the data, uh, we have to parse it and then we can add it to the page. If you compare that to jQuery Ajax, we say get pass in the URL and then when that, when that is done, add it to the page. So it's way less code that we had to write. Now, down now now. Uh, this, on the left-hand side, is an abstraction. If you're new to coding, this might be your first exposure to an, to an abstraction. But uh, as a developer, all I have to do is say $.get, and jQuery takes care of all of the details. Behind the scenes, this is doing the exact same thing. Um, behind the scenes, this 
you, you best believe inside of jQuery, there is code that looks like this, um, but it's more dynamic because they can set the URL, they can set everything else. Yeah, and so that's the other cool thing that jQuery is doing for us. It's automatically parsing the response. And so part of an HTTP request, there are various headers. Yeah, so if we, if we were to look at the actual network request that happens here, we can see that the request was for videos, but that server responded, um, which should have responded with the, oh no, that's the, uh, is that the pre-flight? I'm baffled because uh, this is not, <laughs> this is not setting the content type header. Is it cached? Oh, there's an ad happening right now, anyways. Um, my endpoint doesn't set the headers. Yeah, there it is. That's super weird. I guess the browser cached it and it had the cached headers, but this server does respond with a content type of application JSON. Behind the scenes, jQuery, uh, using the request, it can look at rec. Um, headers received, so the headers that came back in the response. And if it looks at the content type header and sees that the content type is application.json, it will automatically parse it. Um, and so all of that code is hidden from us. All of that code somebody wrote, but we don't have to write it ourselves. Um, so this is great. Uh, I use jQuery Ajax for the longest time. You can also see that it has this dot done thing. This is also uh, basically what we did before we had promises. This is known as the deferred API. Um, But uh, cool, 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 cool. No, I'm pretty sure you can access the response headers in Fetch. Actually, I will show that because that's one of the reasons why I would choose Axios over Fetch. Um, talk about errors, sure, 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 sure. So with XML HTTP requests, um, I believe we have to add an event listener for, uh, yeah, error. Um, let's see if we can get this to work. Oh no! And then log the error. How do we demonstrate an error? Um, a non-existent website? Let's try it. I mean, <laughs> I get a cores error, but that's just because that domain doesn't exist. What's the best way to simulate an HTTP error? Isn't there that um, HTTP status? Um, isn't there a site that, that mimics HTTP statuses? Does this website do that? No, it's a 200 status code. I thought I went there. Am I spelling it wrong? Simulate HTTP errors. Is it HTTP? It's not HTTPS? It doesn't work. It doesn't work. I'm telling you, it doesn't work. 
Um, why is this so hard? Do I need the dub dub dub? It's broken in Firefox. So uh, the issue is also that we need um, um, we need it to also support course. Like if we look in the network tab. This is a 200 status code. Yeah, it could be an issue with my DNS. Oh, well. Yeah, somebody asked about app ideas. Do we have a, uh, we should have a command for this. If, you have, if you're looking for beginner app ideas, definitely check out that repo. Um, yeah, I thought it simulated error codes too. I think, you know, I, I think I feel like I run into this all the time. Like, I guess if, <laughs> if this website worked, that's what we would use. Um, Oh, and thank you, thank you, CM Griffin. D does it um, does it simulate the status codes? No, because this this gives us back a two hundred status code. I almost want to deploy a serverless function that just responds with a like a 500 status code. I probably need to do that. Um, yeah. Okay. Give me a second. Does that work, Acid Spark? Well, it need the the other issue is it needs if we want to demonstrate it here, it needs to support cores. Um, yeah, this doesn't support cores. Okay, give me a second while I uh, build a server. Yeah, everyone else is saying that website works for them. I think it's an issue with my DNS on like locally here. Um, Actually, I could just add an endpoint or a query parameter. No, let's just create a service for it, right? Because um, um, then it's uh, then it's just uh, hosted on Versal. Okay, uh, this actually is the code um, that uh, that runs for that videos API, because it makes the request to the the Google API, and then then adds it all together. Um, but here's what I want to do: instead of responding like this. Um, We're just going to respond with an object. Uh, if rec dot, do we have access to the query parameters here? Also, I can get rid of all this other stuff too. Yeah, that's what I want to do with this drills, but I'm doing it with uh, versal uh, serverless functions. So, uh, rec dot query dot yeah. So we'll just do it with a with a query param. Um, uh, 
I guess we we could do it with a um, uh, a rewrite, but for now, let me just do it with a query param. So if rec dot query dot status is a thing, um, then status is uh, this thing as a number. Um, and then we just return that status like that. Do we have a rewrite? Yeah, we have a rewrite. So source, I guess we could just do this because it'll be this website slash 200 and then that will just respond with a 200 status code. Um, Uh, can I use params in rewrites? Does anybody know Versal? Pattern that matches the incoming path name, including query string. Yeah, I guess we'll, we'll just uh, we'll just have to manually parse it. Um, so, any request coming into our app gets redirected here, and then uh, this will be rec. Dot uh, URL. And we'll have to parse that. Um, let's just test this really quick. Um, can I do versal dev? Oh, well, uh, I know I can do that, but I want it to be at the root. So um, let's see. Invalid source pattern. <laughs> I can't just have a bear, uh, like a, f a redirect everything. Dots, dot star? OK. Yeah, so if we go to slash 200, the URL is slash 200. That's what we'll do. Um, so status code is rec.url.substring. How does substring work? Start at 1 and don't pass in the end. So um, that's going to give us the URL that they went to. Um, without the slash. And then I can say if uh, is nan, just respond with a 200 status code. Um, why is this complaining? Yeah, I, I know better than you TypeScript. Um, And then if it's not nan, we can just get the status as a number with the status code. And then um, just return it like that. <laughs> OK, so now. Uh, that responds with status 200. If I go to like anything else, it just responds with status code 200. Um, and you'll see the status code is 200. Great. But if I go to like 404, 
it responded with status code 404. Or if I um, ask for 418, it responds with status code 418. Great. Great. This is the API we've always wanted to exist, and now it exists. I guess technically, <laughs> I guess technically that other site exists. But uh, wait, 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 wait. Um, it was using. Wait, was I in the right folder? I need to make sure that uh, there isn't anything hanging around from um, the old one. Cool. Table the names of statuses and show them in the response. What do you mean by that? Chosen alias is already. What should we call this thing? Um, statuses? <laughs> should you be statuses? Have a file with the numbers mapped to the name. Oh yeah, I think there, there's a like a an npm package we could install for that. HTTP Orama. Well, the thing is, I literally can't get here, and I, honestly, oh, it's working now. But also, this is what we need to know: does it support cores? It doesn't support cores, so this would have this would have burned us anyways. Um, so we're make we're making an. How do I alias this? There we go. My serverless. <laughs> Come on. What about that? There we go. Why does it fail at the root? I guess I didn't t test that. Why not run this locally? Because I'm going to publish these examples. And this is going to be a YouTube video. So I want people to be able to. I mean, they potentially could um, could code along. Range error, invalid status code zero. Wait, is it because it's the empty string? There we go. <laughs> um. We could make this API a little bit nicer. Um, HTTP status utility. Yeah, something like this could be cool because we, um, um, uh, we could pass in all the stuff. I, I, just looking at their example, I don't, I don't like it. No one has constants? How do I use them? I mean, that's that's not. That's also not what we want. Can you, can you link me to uh, some examples? Um, Then how do I how do I use it? I 
I think I'm going to need a package because I think I want more than just the... Um, Um. Oh, it's literally just from HTTP. Oh. Don't know if I can do that. I don't get a uh, autocomplete. enough. Do they have 418? I'm a teapot. <laughs> Do they have 420? Enhance your calm. No, they don't. Do they have 99999? Invocation failed. Um... Invalid status code. 1.29839. <laughs> what's, what's the maximum possible uh, status code? Five ninety nine? I on it like I guess like six hundred. Five ninety nine, yeah. Great. All right. This is it. This is the one. I guess I just don't know how Versal works anymore, but why is my alias not working? HTTP statuses. Cool. All right. All of that work just so I can show you error handling. So um, back to this example where uh, we made the request. Um, I want to demonstrate what happens if there was an error. So. In this example, um, I'm instead of making a request to get the video data, I'm making a request to this endpoint I created that should return a status code of 500, which should result in an error. Let's see what happens. It actually doesn't care about status codes. Um, Requests dot. Status? Like, I don't even think we have, like, is okay or anything like that. It might be that XML HTTP requests, you actually had to manually look at the status code. I guess that's how fetch works, so that makes sense. <laughs> that's, that's why I don't like fetch. 
or why I choose not to use it in most situations. Um, returns the numerical HTTP status code. Yeah. Yeah, that's not an error, Dota 2. Um, yeah, fetch is fine. It's not that I don't like it. It's that it there's a lot that it doesn't do, which is why I reach for something like Axios. Um, okay, this is curious, though. Okay, so uh, this actually does not throw an error unless it was like a network error or something like that. Um, let's see how jQuery Ajax handles this, and then we'll keep moving to the, to the other examples. So with jQuery Ajax, um, if I were to make a request here, does this go to the, I think there's an error. Dot error is not a function. Dot fail is what we want. It does go to dot fail. Um, is the server responding with application JSON? Content type, yeah, it is, okay. Data, text, error thrown. Internal server error, cool. So, um, <laughs> All of this to say that jQuery Ajax is actually handling this on our behalf. So if the server responds with a non-success status code, it's going to send us into this fail function where we can handle that error. Uh, with XML HTTP requests, we, we technically need to handle this manually. Like this error one isn't going to get called. Um, right here, we would need to say like if rec.status uh, is, and then we'd have to look at the definition for a, uh, success status code range for HTTP requests. Uh, between 200 and 299. But the thing is, even if it's a redirect, that's successful. So between 200 and 399. So if rec.status is greater than or equal to 200 and rec.status is less than or equal to 399, then we can uh, add them to the page because it was successful. And really, we should only, I guess in our case, we can parse it no matter what. Um, else, we'll just log JSON and say error status code. So now with XML HTTP request, this is, this is how, we, how we handle that. Um, and let's, let's see that example here error status code, and then we get that error object. Um, so there, there's even more work involved in handling errors here. Um, this would be like a network error. Whereas in the jQuery Ajax example, um, it we can explicitly handle it in our fail function. Yeah. Um, okay, let's keep moving. So uh, we have XML HTTP requests. We have jQuery Ajax. Um, uh, let's talk about Axios. So um, Axios uh, was essentially like jQuery Ajax, but without all the other jQuery stuff. So jQuery itself is a pretty big library. Um, that can do a lot. So uh, we specifically were just using the Ajax capabilities of it, um, but it also uh, can do DOM traversal and manipulation. It can handle events. Uh, and, and these two bullet points here are do a whole lot more. And um, 
Axios came along and it basically was kind of just this piece of jQuery, the jQuery Ajax piece. Um, but let's see what Axios calls themselves in their documentation. A promise-based HTTP client for the browser and Node.js. Um, yeah. I don't really know the history of it. Like, I mean, we could look to see like how long this project has been around. Um, but we're seeing an ad. Okay, I'll pause. <laughs> hmm. Twenty fourteen. Welcome in, Jeff. Glad to have you. We're talking about HTTP requests in JavaScript. Um, does Axios have a Wikipedia page? Ajaxios? <laughs> um, Yeah. Okay. So Axios came about in, in 2014. Um, and it, and it works in a similar way that we saw with jQuery Ajax, except its sole purpose is to do HTTP requests. So let's see an example, uh, with Axios. Um, so I copied all this. We're going to update this to say, uh, Axios. Oh, I gotta wait for the ad to finish. Sorry, 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 sorry. What does Axios do that fetch doesn't? I'll show you. I'll show you now. <laughs> Well, in a second, I'm, it's taking me a while to get to the, the right answer, but, or to the, to the point of all of this, but we'll get there in a second. Hmm. Well, I'll do Axios first because it came out first and then I'll, and then I'll come, I'll compare the two. Um, because Axios is going to be really simple. But welcome back, everyone. The ad is over. Uh, we are now going to talk about Axios. Axios. So I have created a folder here called Axios. I changed the title. It's still bringing in the styles here. But now instead of bringing in jQuery, we need to bring in Axios. So let's go find Axios on a CDN. Um, right here. Looks good to me. So. Just like we had to add jQuery as a, as a script on the page, now we add Axios as a script and we get access to that script inside of app.js here. So now over here, um, we'll convert this to Axios. It's just gonna be axios.get. And then Axios uses a promise-based API. So we use, we use dot then and we use dot catch. Um, and you can see that it, uh, it it looks almost the exact same as jQuery Ajax, um, but in this case, we only have access to Axios. We don't have access to jQuery because we've only added Axios to the page here. Um, but let's see if it works. So uh, I'm going to add a link to the Axios page here. And we'll go to the home page, click on Axios. And then it made a request to videos. Um, we tried to add those videos to the page and then nothing happened. Undefined. AppJS line eight. Oh. Um, catch is a little bit different than, than uh, jQuery fail. Let's see what the error was. Videos.4h is not a function. Ah, okay. So that's, that's the other, that's the other issue. Um, uh, Axios doesn't just c c completely give us back the, 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 the parse data itself. It basically gives us back like a, we can call it the response. And then response has a data property. That data property is the actual parse data. So that's how Axios is slightly different. Now, if we do this, it works the same way. Great. Um, so 
Comparing Axios with uh, jQuery Ajax, not much different. I think this is uh, Axios is just a more modern API. We see this dot then and dot catch. This is promises. Um, the JavaScript world uses promises these days. This dot done dot fail is is old stuff. This is uh, the deferred API. Though I, I do think they might actually support the promise API too, but that's older stuff. Um, and then similarly, if we were to make a request that gets an error, um, now we can actually handle that here. And I do believe this is going to give us, again, it gives us the response, but we have access to like response.data, which would be the actual parsed error response. Let's see. Um, Oh no, so this is, okay, it's it's even, it's different than that. So this is, this gives us back the error. And then Axios has done the nice thing of actually parsing the error response so that way we can get access to it here. So it's error.response.data. So here we can see if we wanted to actually get the data associated with that error response, Axios has already parsed that for us and we can, we can use it. Okay, so this is Axios. Now, <laughs> let's emulate this exact same thing with fetch. And I will show you all of the things we have to do to make it work the exact same way. And it's quite a bit. Uh, so here we go. I'm actually, for, we'll start off with just a copy. We'll rename it to fetch. Um, one of the nice things about fetch is that it does not require a dependency. So in the uh, jQuery Ajax example, we needed a script an external script. In the Axios example, we needed one. Here in the fetch example, we do not need anything external. All of uh, fetch is built into the web browser. So uh, that's one of the benefits, is we don't have to install a, sep a separate library, which is great. Uh, but now let's update the, the JavaScript. Um, so uh, the way fetch works is you pass in the URL, and then um, you get back the response, but you do have to parse that response uh, manually. So similar to how we had to manually parse it with uh, XML HTTP request. Um, now, uh, to parse the response, you do response.json like this, and this actually returns a promise. Um, if we wanted to like mix dot thens and async await, like technically this could be an async function, and then I could say JSON is this, and I can await it. For now, we're gonna write it with just the chained promises, and then I'll, I'll write like a, a simpler version of it. But we get back the response from requesting uh, this API. Uh, we parse it as JSON, and then we get that JSON. We can do something with it. Um, in this case, we're just going to add those videos to the page. So, um, and then, and then, and then, <laughs> uh, this should do it. So fetch makes, his, makes the request, we parse the response, and then we add those videos to the page. Um, oh, this is the Axios example, sorry. We'll go now to the fetch example. I'll add a link on the home page. Um, I'm trying to keep the example like <laughs> easy for beginners drills. I don't know. Like I feel like implicit returns just add a whole another layer of complexity. There we go. So fetch works just fine. Um, let's write this in a couple of other ways just so you can see what, like what's happening here. Like really what you could do is you can have a function called like uh, get videos. Um, and then we'll make this an async function. Um, and that's when we can use the power of async await. So here we can say uh, response is await this. And then we can say JSON is await this. Uh, and then we can say um, add videos to the page. Actually, I am going to write it like this just because it's going to be easier to demonstrate uh, when there, when, what happens when there's an error. Um, yeah, so uh, when the page loads, call 
get videos. Great. So this this works exactly the same way, but this is using async await, which is pretty nice because we can the the way we are reading the code uh, is more sequential and like our brains can understand this a little bit better uh, versus having to see like all of these chained functions. These two are functionally equivalent. That's what I'm about to show, Chris, because the Axios example does that for us. So you can see in the Axios example, when we made the request that returned a 500 status code, it went into the catch. It went into the catch, and we were able to handle that. Um, what you're going to see with fetch is that it doesn't automatically do that, which is why I don't reach for it as often. So um, what's the catch? So now we're, uh, we're going to force a 500 error. We're making a, a request here. That's going to return a 500 status error. Watch what happens. We get an error. Videos.foreach is not a function. So uh, fetch does not automatically handle if there was an HTTP status code error or in, in a status code that would result in an error. So very similar to how in XML HTTP requests, we literally had to check that response status code to see, like, is it a success status code? And then if it is, do something with the data. But if it's not, then handle the error. We have to do the same thing with fetch. Um, so really what I need to say, if response is OK, add it to the page. Otherwise, for now, we're just going to log that, that, uh, that, that data there. Great. And so now we're logging that error. The other thing is, though, sometimes APIs don't always respond with JSON. What's up, Murdoch? Welcome in. Um, APIs don't always respond with JSON. And right now, the two APIs that we're dealing with do, so I'm not running into an error here. But the other thing that Axios is doing for us is it's doing what's known as content type negotiation. So it's looking at the content type header of the response and then parsing it accordingly. And so if we wanted our, our fetch example to be that equivalent, uh, we'd have to say something like this. So if response was OK, then um, Response dot headers dot get content type. Uh, like this. And then we can say if content type matches, so if content type has the word JSON inside of it, then I know that this server responded with JSON. And then I know that I can parse it as JSON and do something with it. Um, but if it didn't respond with JSON, Oh no. Um, <laughs> uh, then I could uh, just get it as text. So, like, get the text of it um, like this. Um, oh no, JSON. And then just pass the text in here. But um, this is what's happening behind the scenes with, uh, with uh, Axios. Um, and the other issue is, like, depending on if it was a successful request or an error request, this exact same logic needs to happen uh, if the response was not OK. So here I'll say, uh, if the response was not OK, I kind of, I mean, I could, I could refactor this, but I still need to get the content type. Um, and then in this case, log the error. Otherwise, like, log the text here. Like, um, Sometimes when you're dealing with APIs, success responses will return JSON data, but error responses will return like an empty body or, for, or they'll return like a text body for some reason. Um, and you, you do need to handle that depending on the APIs that you're talking to. Um, let's, see, let's see what this does for us. Yeah, so I did the content type negotiation of the error, but if we do uh, the regular request instead, um, that gives us back the data, and, and, that, and then it still works. Um, yeah, and then that's the other thing to think about uh, what, what Fred is mentioning is, so this, this, this parsing it as JSON, like technically, if I didn't check the content type and it wasn't JSON, this could throw an error. And so that's when you would actually want to wrap this whole thing in a try catch, because it's possible that um, when you went to parse it as JSON, the parsing failed. But typically, it would only fail if the content type didn't have JSON in it, uh, which is why it would make sense to, to put it in the try catch here. Um, but then you have to rework your logic, because if you're not doing this content type negotiation, um, then um, 
uh, in your error handler, you need to in, uh, um, inspect that error to see, well, was it a parsing error or was it some other kind of error? And then you can handle that in the catch here. Um, so, yeah. Uh, what's Fred saying? Yeah, so that, that potentially, yeah, that is another way to write it. So if you don't want to do this content type negotiation, you could just do this, get rid of all this. Um, cool, okay, so this code is a little simpler, but now, uh, was this a parsing error? Um, uh, was the uh, request a success error? Or success status code? Well, if we want to know that, then technically we would need access to the response in the catch. And if we wanted to do that, then uh, we would have to do something like let response here, and then we could assign the response, and then in the catch, then we have access to like response.headers and stuff like that. Um, so yeah. Would the catch handle a 500 response in the commented code? No, and so that's the main thing that I was getting at. So right now, uh, if the response status code was a 500 status code, um, we'll, we'll do this. Uh, if this was a, a, a 500 status code, OK is now uh, false. And we're handling that in the else. If you wanted to be consistent about the error handling, you could then forward the error and say, like, throw new error um, with, like, if you, if you know that the JSON was parsed, you could do, like, JSON.message. And then now you have access to that in the catch if you wanted to handle it in the same way. Um, um, yeah, so if the response is okay, do it. If it's not okay, throw, throw an error message like Chris is mentioning. Um, all of this to say, I don't want to write all this code. <laughs> I don't know if you can tell. I don't know if you can tell in the tone of my voice. I don't want to write all of this code. Like, the, the reason I'm going through all of these different possible scenarios is because the Axios library handles all of that. So, and it's all hidden away from me. I, we talked about abstractions earlier today. Um, this is an abstraction and it's a good one. It is a good abstraction because uh, it, it, it does all of the things that I talked about. Um, a simple utility method, but I guess that's the thing. Like if you, if you know exactly what APIs you're talking to and you know the kind of responses they're going to give you back, you could create your own utility library that was not, not, complex enough that it has to handle every possible scenario, but it handles the API that you're talking to. Um, I just reach for Axios because it's, it, it behaves the same way regardless of what API I'm talking to. So uh, make the request. What's hidden behind, like what's abstracted away this dot then is it automatically looks at the content type header. It automatically looks at the response status code um, and it automatically parses the response based on the content type header. Uh, and if the response status code was not successful, it throws the error. And if the content type of the error response was JSON, it parsed that so I can get access to it as well. So um, this is hiding a whole bunch of implementation details that I want when I'm making API requests. Fetch requires you to do a lot more work. And, and that's fine, like it, it depends on, on the kind of app you're working in as well, because um, when you add Axios, you are adding a dependency, you're adding more code, right? You're at, like, this is more code that the user has to download. And so that will potentially affect the load time of your web page. But uh, it's, it's like a, it's a pro and a con, you have to weigh it. Like, am I willing to load that library so that I get this benefit? Um, I will also mention that there's this library called Redaxios. Um, and there's a few other versions of this that basically has the exact same API as Axios, but it just uses fetch under the hood, so it's a whole lot smaller. Um, I won't show an example with this because it looks exactly the same, but it, it is something that um, you could look into as well, um, like Redaxios. Uh, people mention like got and stuff like that. 
Yeah, I'll take a quick stretch. <laughs> What's up, Alistar Plays? I feel like it's been a while since you've been here. Welcome in. But they say, no, I must handle every scenario and send a five megabyte bundle to the client. It's not, I mean, we're, we're exaggerating. We're poking fun. It's not five megabytes, um, but it is not free, right? So, um, what is happening? Oof. Oof. Um, if you look at America 2050 link to this website, that will show you how big the, the website is. So 10 kilobytes. If you add access to your page, the, the end user is getting 10 kilobytes more data. Yeah. Um, so. Can you use all of these server sites? So you can definitely use Axios on the server side. Um, I don't think you can use jQuery Ajax on the server side, and you really wouldn't want to. Honestly, the, these days, like I showed jQuery Ajax as an example, but no, no one should really be reaching for jQuery Ajax these days. Um, cool. So all of this came from a uh, question from, uh, who, who was it? Pete. I don't know if you're still here, Pete. <laughs> <laughs> it took me what an hour and a half to get to the point of answering your question. Uh, and actually, yeah, we can we let's let's just come up with our own little pros and cons um, uh, table as well. Axios pros and cons. How do I do a markdown table? How to create a great looking markdown table. That's really all I wanted. Um, Pros, cons, what's up Electrothermal, welcome in. We are here settling the debate of whether or not people should use Axios. <laughs> I don't think I've settled the debate, but I've, uh, I've given people reasons why they should or shouldn't use, use Axios over Fetch. And we're about to make that table right now. Um, <laughs> juicy apples is a pro, that's funny. Uh, pro, um, uh, um, I don't think saving will format the table for me now. What is a pro? Let's look at the code to, to get, get, get the ideas flowing. I like the API. I mean, I, like that is, that's more subjective. Like uh, I've used it a lot and I, I like the API that they provide. Um, I'll just say uh, good TypeScript support. That's, people, that's something people care about. So they have really good TypeScript support for like the Axios response object. Uh, they have generic types. So, uh, I mean, we're not showing that example here, but if I created the interface that defines this response type, um, they have a way of, of, of using their Axios response type in a generic way. Similarly, they have Axios error. So good, really good TypeScript support. Um, I'll say CJ likes the API slash developer experience. I mean, all of this stuff I'm talking about is DX. It's, it's, and, and I talked about abstractions. Like they've abstracted away all of the, the nitty gritty stuff so that I can have a good developer experience. Um, yeah. And then the other thing is, um, uh, HTTP status code error handling. So, uh, we talked about this, but, um, if the API responds with a, a status code that is, um, wait, what? 
What? Oh yeah, I mean, I, I wrote this one with async await. We could we could rewrite this one with async await too. I guess I'll do that just to not confuse people. Um, I mean, it's it's pretty nice when you look at it. Look at that. It's so clean. Uh, why? Yeah, good call, Chris. Um, I mean, I, I originally wrote this with promises, and then we rewrote it to, to show example. But if you were using async await with Axios, this is what it would look like. Arguably, like, even even cleaner than, yeah. OK. Um, HTTP status code error handling. The other thing is uh, content type negotiation. Am I using that right? So. Is content type negotiation something that only happens on the server? Is that technically happening on the client too when we decide how to parse the uh, the response? Um, Specific HTTP headers by the client, which is a standard way of negotiating a specific kind of resource. Um, maybe I just won't call it that. Um, automatic parsing by content type. That's what it does. Um, Error response automatic. Parsing by content type. And I group these into two separate categories because I don't know about you, but I have dealt with uh, APIs that are not consistent. I've dealt with APIs where the success response is a JSON object and the error response is a text. It's not even JSON. Um, um, yeah, I've, I've, just, I've just dealt with a lot of non-standard APIs, and even APIs that were like written by a team of people that I that I worked with were sometimes still inconsistent um, in terms of their like content types. Yeah, just got a meeting for an interview. What are the best places to practice? Oh, you mean like practicing for an interview? I don't have any good resources on that. I know there are some sites uh, where you can actually like mock interview with people. Uh, Mosh Pit says, Joel Spolsky wrote an article. Um, the statement he makes is, all non-trivial ab abstractions to some degree are leaky. Yeah, I think it depends. Like, uh, so the, the idea here would be like this is a potentially leaky abstraction. I mean, and, and the leaks of the abstraction are like, what underlying data do you get access to? Like, um, uh, like response dot, I think like headers and, and, all, and all of like the lower level stuff you technically do get access to. I think you also have like the raw data that you could even just parse yourself. I don't know. Um, I don't, I don't think Axios is a leaky abstraction at all because, uh, it kind of just like hides everything from you. And for the most part, you don't really need to get dig into the things that it's hidden from you. I guess it doesn't hide everything from you. It puts it behind this, this object. And for the most part, you typically only need access to the data. But if you really want to access the other stuff, you can as well. So I don't know. I don't, I don't have a good, uh, uh, good argument for that. Yeah, yeah, so I mean, uh, uh, fundamentally, what's happening in both of these is exactly the same. So this is, uh, async await is just syntactic sugar. It, it makes the code we wrote before look more sequential, but behind the scenes, this still returns a promise. This function still returns a promise. Um, these two are functionally equivalent, uh, 
promises are just how we did things before we had the async and await keyword. Syntactic sugar. Yeah, but and, but these days, most people will use async await uh, for the most part. It, it depends. <laughs> there might be some people that are... I think there are people that are holding on to dot .vin and dot .catch. It is a bit more functional. It's like a chained API way of doing things, but I like this. Okay, what are the other things I like about Axios? Um... Error response uh, status code throws an error. So um, we'll wait till the ad is over before we finish talking about this. But what I'm talking about there is, and I'll reiterate myself when the, when the ad is over, but um, if it's a 500 status code, it throws the error and then you can, you can access it inside of the catch with a fetch that does not happen. Syntactic sugar like saturated. No, I think it's, it's regular plain old sugar, not even fake sugar. <laughs> yeah, I would say bash X, you should look into the company that you're, you're applying to. Like see if anybody has posted what kinds of interviews they do. Um, online, like on Glassdoor or something like that. Um, um, Cause yeah, I, I've, I've seen some people post the actual like interview process for certain companies. So you can kind of know what you're getting into. What else? Yeah. <laughs> Welcome back, everyone. The ads are over. Uh, I just added this line, error response status code throws an error. Because uh, if this responded with a 500 status code, it would actually throw the error and you can access it in the catch. Uh, fetch does not do that. You would have to manually throw the error. Um, can, any, can anyone think of any other reasons why I like Axios? Any other reasons that I've mentioned? Um, laziness i mean it's not about being lazy it's about like you can yeah I mean, but honest i guess at the same time it's not even a it's not even a bad thing like if you uh i i i am lazy and most developers are lazy and i don't want to write all of that extra code because code is a liability right like every extra line of code i have to write just to handle a fetch request I could be using this well-tested, like battle-tested production-ready library instead of writing my own function that I have to go update every now and then when it breaks, you know? So, yeah, and I think we have a uh, success response automatic parsing by content type, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and again, we're, we're getting into like more subjective, <laughs> but like I think it's easier to read. Um, Library has been around for a long time, and a lot of people trust it. Sure. Sure. Um, and I guess that's the other thing is uh, less custom code in your code base. Less custom HTTP handling code in your code base. Less liability. Okay, let's talk about why the reasons Axios is bad. Uh, 10 kilobytes to your end users. <laughs> this one? 
Twenty nine. Yeah, I mean, you can you can talk about. I mean, that's that's insane <laughs> to see, but like, it is it is very well. Thirty six million weekly downloads. Star Fox. I don't know where your numbers are coming from. <laughs> that's insane. Uh... Well, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I think uh, I think that's a con as well. So plus ten kilobytes to your end users. Uh, another dependency to manage, right? Fetch is not a dependency, it's just built in. Um, I'm just gonna put this right here, like 36 million weekly downloads on NPM. So the con is it's gonna add more, is it capital KB? Lowercase k, capital B. your payload another dependency to manage like keep updated um, uh, non-standard API meaning like it's not built into the browser it is an external thing yeah any other cons of using Axios But also, you see me writing this weird code? Check it out. It gets turned into this really cool table. Oh yeah, um, a pro would be like supports older browsers. Works in browsers that do not have fetch. Yeah, I think that's the one of the main issues though. Um, the last two cons are the same. To make, wait, wait, what do you mean? Which ones are the same? Plus 10 kilobyte payload, another dependency to manage, a non-standard API. Oh, sure. I think I think they have their own points because like dependency management is one thing. Dealing with something that's not a standard is another thing. I don't know. Any other cons? All right, let's let's work on the uh... Ew. <laughs> I do not like that. <laughs> I do not like that, Oscar. Um, I guess if I turn line wrap off, it looks okay. Yeah, okay. Uh, Babel could be a way to, to polyfill it. Um, polyfill fetch. How does Axios compare to node fetch and got? Well, so we're going to make a, a fetch uh, pros and cons table here now. Okay. Pros. Built in. So uh, fetch is built into, I don't know the version of Node where it got introduced, but uh, these days you don't have to install it separately in your Node.js app. You just get it for free. Uh, also, as so I built in to most browsers and JS environments. Um, that's a pro. No need to download um, uh, wait, wait. No extra dependency to manage. But does it does it have TypeScript support though? Not like generic <laughs> generic TypeScript support. Like uh, in Axios, you can say get with like my type. And then now instantly a response um, uh, is an Axios response of that type. With fetch, um, you could you could do as so it doesn't have generics, but you can say like as my type like this, which is a little more clunky. Um, 
I mean, these two are like one in the same, but I think they're both worth worth mentioning. Um, what else? What are some other pros to using fetch instead of Axios? Yeah. <laughs> what Vim theme is? This isn't Vim. <laughs> this is <VS> code. <laughs> What's up, Daddy Ray? Welcome in. Zero, zero weekly downloads. <laughs> Well, it's just built into the browser. It's, uh, you, you get it for free. It's for free. For free. Uh, see you later, bug breaker. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm not even showing all of the benefits of Axios either. So actually, let me add that to the list of pros as well. Um, has uh, ways of intercepting... I'll just put uh, HTTP interceptors. Um, API slash, uh, like, API client instances. So um, you, you can basically write, like, middlewares for these requests that will run on every single request. The other thing is you can create a client that uh, has a specific base URL. So if I do, like, X, I think... I'll have to look up the syntax for this. But if I do axios.client, pass in the base URL as, like, myapi.com, now, uh, with this client instance, I can say git slash, and that's going to request against the base URL. Um, or if I can say, like, git slash entity, um, and that'll be relative to that. Uh, so I, I use this heavily in, in most like most of the apps that I'm working because because this is the thing you do all the time is you're like repeating yourself yeah 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 so I mean obviously like TypeScript itself is just like the developer experience but um, uh, that's what we're talking about here <laughs> like like the ways of using TypeScript with Axios I think is way easier than using with Fetch um, but yeah. Can you have sessions with Axios? I, I don't know. There's probably like a plugin for it. Um, oh, did I get it right? I think, yeah, I guess I got it. I just, just I spelled base URL wrong. HTTP interceptors, API client instances. Um, we can just look on their website. What else do they say? What, what can Axios do? Tran they have transformers. Come on. Come on. Um, yeah, cool, cool. All right. All of the cons of fetches are that they don't have, they don't do this stuff. <laughs> um, cons, um, it's not Axios, uh, must manually, uh, handle HTTP error status codes. Um, must manually um, inspect content type header. Must manually uh, parse Response body. Um, yeah. Um, uh, must cast types. I guess I don't know how I want to word that. Interrupts? I'll say TypeScript support is minimal. Like you technically have the, like, because it's part of the standard, you like, you have the capital R response object type. Um, you have that in TypeScript. And like, I mean, even right now, um, you can see my editor is able to do type completion because fetch is built in. Um, however, 
if we're talking about custom types of the responses, that's that's not something that it can can do out of the box. You have to cast the types. So while there is there is there are TypeScript types that you can use, um, it's not the same as uh, uh, Axios. I, I mean, I, and I don't have examples here to show that, but basically, with Axios, you can say I expect to get this type back. And your your object will be typed in that way. It's it's not it's not type assertion, but it is response dot data will be of a of a, a type instead of the any type. Um, any any other cons here? Cool. Thanks. Thanks, America 2015. Yeah, I think that's the other thing is uh, there are other HTTP libraries. So did I put that in this list here? Yeah, so there's got, um, there's, I think it was literally called request. I think it's deprecated at this point. Um, uh, you, you can't do TypeScript types in a, um, in a JavaScript file, but you can, because we're in VS Code, I can, I do get some type completion, um, but you can't put the types there because then that code wouldn't run in the browser. Well, uh, it uses, no, I think Axios, yeah, Axios does support uh, abort, so they, they updated it. Yeah, check it out, abort controller. Uh, it used to use uh, cancellation token, but these are deprecated, so. Axios is keeping up with the times. I mean, I, I imagine that pretty soon Axios is going to have a version that only uses fetch and doesn't use XML HTTP request. So, yeah. Yeah. Does anybody know what I'm talking about? Didn't they used to... Wasn't there a module called request? What was the one that everyone used? It was in a lot of projects. Python? I'm trying to think of the one. It wasn't node fetch, because node fetch is, is just the fetch API. Mm. Yeah, this is it. This is literally it, but it's deprecated. Yeah, but this is the one that people used to use as well. Yeah. Okay. Oh, you mentioned this has a comparison table. HTTP two support. How does Axios not support that? Oh, they have they have dark mode. This whole time they had dark mode. I'm pretty sure you can use streams with Axios. Cool. So it handles a lot of things that I don't do. <laughs> a lot of things that I don't care about. Um, like I've never used like the built-in pagination of a request library. I've kind of always just done that manually. It's cool. I mean, got looks cool. If we, okay, so if we look at requests, it has 15 million weekly downloads, and that's because of all of those, um, oh, I spelled it wrong. Somebody is typo squatting. I spelled it wrong. <laughs> Here it is, but... This is interesting to note, though, like, even though it's deprecated, still there are 15 million weekly downloads of this request library. So that's the thing. 
Yeah, this is the other interesting piece. If you look on, on NPM, there are 90,000 packages that are dependent on Axios. Yeah, I mean, you could argue that it's like developer installs or CI builds. That's just, that's a, that's a piece of it for sure. Um, what is this one? Node fetch. <clears throat> okay. Um, yeah, yeah, no worries, Chris. Okay, I think, I think I'm ready to just do a quick YouTube video that talks about all this. Cool drills. Yeah, glad to hear it. Uh, <laughs> um, for those of you that haven't heard uh, of a thing called typo squatting, people will have packages that are like slightly misspelled. Like, pro like, what about got with two T's? Does that exist? It does. <laughs> um, and somebody could put like a malicious package there if somebody actually uh, accidentally installs it. Cool. Um, all right, so this is going to be the last thing that I uh, that I talk about, but um, I'm basically going to um, do a whirlwind overview of all the stuff that I talked about throughout this for a YouTube video. It's probably going to take me like 10 minutes or so to just go through everything, but we'll see. Um, yeah, Ax Axios is still on top. It's funny to see like these, I mean, either their their metric collecting all went down at the same time or like, yeah, Christmas Day makes sense. Or like a day after Christmas. Um, I don't know what, uh, if this is like UTC time because like technically if this is UTC, then it would have been December 25th in the US. Uh, but yeah, Christmas, Christmas Day, people stopped installing packages. <laughs> No, no one's pushing updates. <laughs> yeah, jQuery still has 4 million weekly downloads. Yeah, it's crazy. Um, I mean. I mean. Okay. Let me make sure my code examples look good, because I, I I'm not going to write all the code from scratch. I am just going to po point at the, ex the code that I have. That looks good. XML HTTP request looks good. Um, that looks good. I'm making the request to the error one. There we go. What's up, Grandmaster? Welcome in. Do I want to do a focus mode? Um, I guess so. I'm also gonna I'm gonna turn my heater off.
because my, my air conditioner is still on. I might go turn that off too. <laughs> okay. Alka's out here dropping, and he missed. <laughs> um, I'm just going to update all of these really quick. What's up? It's, it's uh, by Thero. Welcome in. Ooh, and an ad just started. Perfect. Perfect. I don't know what keyboard shortcut I just did, but um, here is the uh, process manager for Firefox. <laughs> no idea. Uh, I'm about to... Uh, review all of this, the examples that I just wrote to, to basically summarize everything for a, for a YouTube video. Because somebody asked the question, what are the pros and cons of using Fetch over Axios? So we're going to talk about that. Um, cool. All right. I'll be back in two minutes. Got to go turn my AC off. thought an ad had started, but it, uh, it's not going to start for two minutes. <laughs> I guess, can I snooze it? Snooze for five minutes. Well, well. Okay. Well, if you don't want an ad while I'm making this video, please consider subscribing. Um, you can use uh, Prime as well. So uh, the, this is the only question I'm going to ask for today. Um, I will say if you have questions that didn't get answered, uh, definitely go over to our Discord. We have a help forum. You can ask there. Um, and uh, I'll do my best to answer it, or people in the community will do, do their best to, to answer the question as well. Okay, here we go. Um, I guess I will go into focus mode for this for this thing. <clears throat> Hello, friends. Welcome to Coding Garden. In this video, I am going to answer the question: um, 
why would you use Axios over Fetch? Or what are the pros and cons of using Axios versus Fetch? This question came from Pete Powell. Um, so first, we're going to answer the question, take a step back and answer the question, what is Ajax? Because that is the basis for all uh, for this discussion of Axios versus Fetch. So Ajax stands for Asynchronous JavaScript and XML. It is a thing that has been a part of um, web browsers and web applications uh, for a while now. It first appeared in 1999. Um, and it has the word XML in, in the term. Uh, but these days... Uh, data on the web isn't just XML. A lot of it is actually JSON data as well. So um, even though it's called AJAX, we can use asynchronous JavaScript and XML to make requests for JSON data as well. Um, but this is a mechanism that allows web pages to make a request for data and then add that data to the page without a full page refresh. Now, an example of this um, is my Coding Garden Videos website. You can see for a slight second, the page is loading. And then finally, uh, after it's gotten the data, um, it uh, shows them. But to show an example, I just deleted the cache data. So now if I do a hard refresh, we see loading for a second. And then finally, the videos load. But the videos in this list are dynamic because they're coming from the YouTube API. Um, and and uh, Ajax is at work here. So basically, when the page loads, JavaScript kicks in, makes the request to the API to get the list of videos, and then adds those videos to the page. So pretty much every website you use these days is using Ajax in, in some capacity. So that's Ajax. Um, but let's take a, a quick trip down memory lane and talk about what we used before Fetch existed. Uh, and that was this thing called XML HTTP requests. So if you look this up on MDN, um, we can find this. Uh, and this is how we made HTTP requests before things like fetch existed. Um, and essentially, what we can do, let me grab the example here. Um, here, here, using XML HTTP requests. So we can write code that looks like this. So we create an instance of XML HTTP requests. This is a, a global object built into every web browser. Um, we pass it a function that will get called when it's complete, and then we can make an HTTP request. In this case, we're making a GET request against this URL. We send it, and then when the data is ready, this function will get called with that data. Um, so before fetch existed, this is how we had to do it. And I have an example of this here. So um, this is the endpoint that that video's website I, show you, I showed you calls to get the list of, of videos. So when you go here, um, this is a backend server that talks to the YouTube API to get a list of all of the, the videos on my YouTube channels uh, and then puts them into this big old array and returns it as JSON data. So we're going to be using this endpoint as an example. And we have our very first example using XML HTTP requests. So if I click this, it takes a second to load, and then we get back all of the videos. Right now, we just have a link that goes off to those videos. Um, but let's look at the code for this. So. Uh, in this folder, uh, there'll be a link to this GitHub repo so you can look at all these examples, but we have a basic HTML page. Uh, we're loading this thing called Pico CSS that just gives us some basic styles. We have a div with an ID of results, and then we are loading our app.js. Now, every single example is going to use this same function, add videos to page, because this is agnostic to how we get the data. So all, this function just cares about the array of videos and it, then it adds them to the page. It doesn't care how you actually got those. So this function just iterates over the videos, creates a, a card with a link for every single one, and then adds it to the page. But we're going to reuse this function uh, in all of our examples. So if we look at XML HTTP requests, and we look at that app.js, we can see it in action. So first, we load in that function that I just showed you. And then we do the business. So we create an instance of XML HTTP request. We add a listener for when load has happened. We add a listener for when error happens. And then we make the request, and uh, we get back the response. Now, some things to note about XML HTTP request is it does not do any sort of parsing for you. You have to do that. And so we know that that API returns JSON. So we have a line of code that parses the response text as JSON. Um, the other thing that XML HTTP, HTTP request doesn't handle is if the response is not a success status code. So if you're looking at HTTP status codes, any status code between 200 and 399 
is technically a success status code. Anything uh, above that, like 404 is not found, or 500 is internal server error, or 401 is unauthorized. Any of those status codes are considered an error. Um, and so if you wanted to handle that, you would have to do that manually. So I have an if statement checking for the status code. If it's good, we can call that function and just add the data to the page. Uh, if it's not good, we can do something with that error. Um, and then uh, if there was some sort of network error, like maybe the URL wasn't accessible, this function would get called. Um, so to see an example of that, if we go back over here to XML HTTP requests, let's look at the console, and then let's comment this out so that it makes a request to get a 500 error. And then now we see that error in, in the console, internal server error. Um, so handling errors is a little bit cumbersome, but that's how we did it with XML HTTP request. Um, let's take a quick stretch. Whew. Now, 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 now. Uh, the code you just saw was very cumbersome to write. Um, and I will admit when I was first learning JavaScript, I, it took me forever to even wrap my mind around like how to do this. It's not even that complicated really. Cause it's just send it a URL give it a function that should call be called when it's done. But still, I could never find good examples of this online. and was always like really confused. Uh, and then this thing called jQuery Ajax came along. Uh, and this is built into the jQuery library. So we'll show this example next. Um, you can see everything looks the same. The only thing that's different is we've added a link to the jQuery library. And now that we've done this, inside of our JavaScript file, we have access to all of the things that jQuery provides. Um, and so if we look at this example, it's a little bit simpler, a little bit simpler than the uh, XML HTTP request example. Uh, and so this is known as jQuery Ajax. So we're using jQuery to make that HTTP request. Uh, and then this is using the deferred API. If you're familiar with promises, this is basically what we had before promises were, were an actual thing uh, built into JavaScript. Um, uh, you see done and fail, very similar to like .bin and .catch. But uh, when this request is done, add the videos to the page. If it failed, log the error to the console. Um, so if we look at this example with jQuery Ajax, it works exactly the same way, but the code is a little bit simpler. Um, and really what this is doing is XML HTTP requests. So jQuery has essentially abstracted away all of the, the details of like, calling the load function. It, it also has uh, abstracted away having to manually parse the response. You can see here that I'm not doing json.parse. jQuery Ajax handled that for us. Um, and also we have this like chained dot done dot fail API. There's another API you could use, but this is the one that I used uh, before I stopped using jQuery Ajax. Uh, but this is another way of doing it. And again, if we wanna look at these uh, side by side, um, you can see that this requires quite a bit more code, especially looking at the status code. So that's one thing to compare. In this case, we had to look at the status code to know if it was a success. In this case, uh, if we get an error, so let's switch this out to, to get a 500 error, um, it's going to run the fail for us. So we see it's internal server error. It runs that for us. Uh, whereas in the, in the other example, we saw, um, uh, we had to manually look at that. Yeah, and, and, and Moshpit is asking, well, how does it know to parse this as JSON? It's looking at the content type header. Um, I'll show an example of that when, when we use fetch, how you would do that with fetch. But basically, the API is responding with a header that says the content inside is JSON. And uh, the jQuery library is able to look at those headers, say, oh, it said it's JSON, let me try parsing it. It parsed it, and then we can get access to it. If the parse failed, or like it threw an error, it, that would have gone into the fail function, but it essentially looked at, at that response header, header so that it knew that it was JSON data. So that's jQuery Ajax. I used this for a very long time. Um, and uh, until this thing called Axios came around. So uh, Axios is a promise-based HTTP client for the browser and Node.js. It came out in around 2014. Um, and it looks very similar to jQuery Ajax. Let's look at, it, at, at, at an example with Axios. So uh, again, the file is mostly the same. The only difference is we're adding this Axios library instead of jQuery. And now inside of our JavaScript, we can see the magic. Um, I guess the other thing is since uh, Axios is promise-based, we're able to use async await. Um, 
uh, when I upload this code to GitHub, I'm going to leave this commented out code. This is using promises with .bin and .catch, but the code is functionally equivalent to async await. So we're going we're gonna to focus on this code because it's a bit easier to, to read. So uh, we have this function called get videos. Um, we're not calling it anywhere, which is an error. We need to at least call it. But when the page loads, we call the function. That makes a git request to get the videos. Um, Axios gives us back this response object that has quite a few properties on it, one of them being data, which is the parsed data we got back from the API. You also have access to headers and, and a few other things. Uh, and in this case, we just pass that data right into add to videos to page. And then in this case, you can see we have this try catch. So if the API were to return an error, or there was a parsing error or something else, this catch would get called so we can handle the error there. Let's see this in action. So if we look at the Axios one, works the same way. But uh, if we force it to get a 500 error, let's see what happens. We can see that it logs uh, the response here. And, and this is the actual response object that's getting returned from this API. I, I guess I didn't show that. But this is a little API we wrote that responds with the given um, uh, HTTP status code. Uh, you'll see like in the network response, this is literally a 500. You could also simulate like a 401 um, and, it, and it will do that. So uh, this API actually is responding with an object. Uh, even though it's an error, it's still an object that has some, some data inside of it like that. Um, okay, and that brings us to Fetch. So this is Axios. Um, it has a lot of other features that I'm not showing here, but for the most part, it, it's essentially a really easy way to make API requests. And for the longest time, um, this is was the easiest way of doing it, right? Because if you if you wanted to do it manually, you'd have to do it this way with XML HTTP requests. This is really clunky. A lot of people reached for Axios because it it hid all of that that all of the the extra code from you, uh, and was a lot easier to use. And then came along Fetch. So Fetch is built into the web browser and now built into most JavaScript runtimes, like including the, like the latest Node.js. I don't know the exact version of Node, but Fetch is now actually completely built in. Um, so uh, if you look up Fetch on MDN, this is a global uh, browser object. Um, and they also have a support table. They'll tell you. Uh, which web browsers support it, and pretty much all web browsers, all modern web browsers, web browsers that people are actually using, all of them support fetch. Now, what that means, if we look at this fetch example, um, you'll notice in the HTML, we have no extra dependency, right? So if you look at the example with Axios, we had to add the Axios library. If you look at jQuery Ajax, we had to add the jQuery library. In the fetch example, no external dependency. Um, it is literally just built in, so we don't have to add anything extra. And thank you, Drills, for that. So Node 18 is the one where we got access to fetch inside of, uh, inside of Node. Um, but let's look at the, the fetch code for this. So um, if I look at this, uh, you can see it, it looks similar to, uh, to Axios. So we can make the fetch request against this specific endpoint. Um, in order to parse the response, there's this built-in function called .json that will parse the response as JSON. You'll notice this also returns a promise, so we have to await it. Uh, there's a few other uh, functions built in. There's .blob if you want the binary data, and there is .text if you want um, just the, the text version of that data. In this case, we know that it's JSON, so we can call that function. Um, but then one of the things uh, about fetch is that it also doesn't do error handling just like XML HTTP requests and that you kind of have to manually do this. So response.ok is a Boolean and it's true if the response status code uh, is within the success range. Uh, and we can see how we did that manually over here. So if the status code is greater than or equal to 200 and less than or equal to 399, then OK will be true. And if that's true, that means uh, the API said everything's good to go. We should have that data, and then we can add it to the page. If it's not true, then we need to do something. Uh, we need to handle the error in some way. Um, in this case, I'm just going to log out uh, that error. Um, uh, and let's see this in action. So we go back. We go to the fetch example. It just works. Beautiful. But now if we make the request against something that's going to return an error, we can see that Text is not defined on line 17. What? Oh, right here. <laughs> um, I technically want that to be JSON. Here we go. 
yeah. So you can see that uh, when it threw an error, now we had to manually check for that, and then we can we could do something with it. Um, and this is fetch. So uh, on the surface, it's really nice. And also, like if I didn't do this response.ok okay thing, I mean the code would look very simple, right? If this is if this is all the code that I would have to write, uh, like this, just as an example. Um, if this is all the code I have to, I would have to write. Great, like it's built into the browser. I don't have to add a separate library, um, but there is is more code you have to write, and that's going to kind of get to the pros and cons of using Fetch over Axios. Um, okay, so this is the example example with Fetch. Now let's talk about why you would use one over the other. So. Um, I spent some time coming up with pros and cons of Axios versus Fetch, and uh, we'll talk about those now. Um, so, uh, first of all, Axios has really good TypeScript support. Now, if you're a beginner, and maybe you don't care about TypeScript, but uh, Axios has generics, uh, generic versions of their functions, so that uh, when you're doing axios.get, you can actually pass in like my response type like this, and it will it'll automatically type uh, response.data to that type. So that's really nice. Um, and I like that. And if you if you're using TypeScript, it works works really well with that. Um, to contrast that, uh, fetch uh, has minimal TypeScript support. like you would have to actually cast the response to a type. Um, so there's that. Um, I really like the the API or the, the 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 developer experience of Axios. Now, API is a loaded word, but API stands for uh, application programming interface. Uh, the fact, that I have this object called Axios, and I call functions on it, like .get, that is the API. I know that's confusing because this endpoint I'm hitting is a web API, but that's different. I'm talking about the general term API because these functions that I call, like Axios.get or Axios.post, um, or if I wanted to create an instance of a, a client, I could say like Axios.client, pass an object, give it a base URL, like this, um, and then I get a client instance where I can say like client.get that is like against that base URL. So th this is the API that I'm talking about, like what functions are available to me and, and how do I use that library? And in my opinion, I, I like it. I like the way that uh, uh, Axios works. Um, the other thing is HTTP status code error handling. Uh, Axios has this, and this, this is, what I, is what I was showing here. So. When we made that request against a, a, an endpoint that returns an error, Axios automatically looks at that and automatically throws an exception behind the scenes, which will automatically get sent to this catch. And that I really like. I don't have to write the code to do that manually with fetch. So in the case of fetch, you can see here that we um, we have to look at the response uh, dot OK property to see if there was an error. Uh, if if I didn't look at this, then I I'm just blindly assuming that it was successful. But you should be doing some error handling. But with fetch, you do have to do manual error handling. So that's that's one of the things I like about Axios. You don't have to do manual error handling. Um, the other thing is success response automatic parsing based on content type. So um, right now, response dot data is a JSON object that automatically got parsed behind the scenes by Axios. And Axios is looking at the content type header uh, of that response to know that it should parse it as JSON. Uh, with fetch, right now we're just assuming that it's JSON, right? So we, we did that. If, if you really wanted the, this to be a bit more robust, um, you would have to do write some code that looks like this. So if response.headers, um, let's grab the content type header. Let's put that in a variable, content type like this, and then we could uh, inspect it. So if I if this is a string, and if I try to match against it and say, okay, does this string have the word JSON inside of it? Okay, yes, it does. Then that means my, my data um, is of type JSON. So I could, I could parse it like this. Um, if it doesn't, then data might actually just be text, and I could do something like this. Um, also, if the content type was like, an octet stream or something like that, then I would want to use blob instead. But if I wanted to do this type of content type negotiation, I, I don't know if that's the right term for it, but basically look at the content type and decide how to parse it. 
I'd have to manually write that code with fetch. With Axios, I don't. It, all of that is abstracted away from me. So the Axios library handles all of that, and it knows that. Uh, well, it doesn't know it. 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 There's. There's code in the Axios library that looks like this. It's looking at that content type header. If it has JSON, it parses it at JSON. That's the thing. Yeah, you can still chat. I'm just, <laughs> I'm trying to focus on this for now. But yeah, you're, you're welcome to chat. I appreciate your messages in the background. Um, so th this is what I'd have to write if I really wanted to make sure that I was doing it the right way. Now, now you could argue that in, in this scenario, um, I because I'm in control of the API, I always know that the API is going to return JSON, whether or not it's an error or not. So my code can get simpler, but that is one of the reasons why I like Axios. I don't have to. I don't have to do that. <laughs> Regardless of the API that I'm talking to, my code is going to look the same, and it's going to handle all of that. Yeah. Um, the error response status code throws an error. Yeah, we already talked about that. So if this was a 500 status code, it goes into the catch. That means it throws an error, and then also the catch. Uh, does automatic content type negotiation. Let's take another another stretch here. Um, in the scenario where there was a catch, like you, you can't always assume that an API is going to give you the same data type when there was a success and there was an error. For good APIs, you can't expect that, but if the API, for whatever reason, returned a text type for an error, Axios would handle that as well, and the data property would be that that text property. In this case, the error response is JSON, so it, we're handling that there. Um, and Anthony writes code. Thank you for the raid. Welcome in, raiders. I'm in the middle of a YouTube video. We're talking about Axios versus Fetch, and right now we're talking about the pros and cons of Axios over Fetch. Um, another pro of Axios is uh, uh, less less code, right? So when I when I use Axios, this is all the code that I have to write, and we're good to go. If you're using Fetch, um, the the code can get a lot more intense and more cumbersome, uh, depending on what you're doing. Yeah, no Python. We're mainly talking about JavaScript. <laughs> you have a question. What is the worst configuration management language? I don't know. I I. I don't have a good answer for you. I like JSON. I like JSON data. <laughs> and YAML seems fine, but I don't know all the rules of YAML. I don't know. Um, but yeah, so if you're using fetch, you, you have more code that you need to write. You have to, you objectively have to write more code. Uh, and in the, in the world of, of managing a code base, uh, good answer, Go, cool. <laughs> in the world of managing code bases, um, less code is better, right? Because the more code you have, that's more code that could break. That's more code that you have to manage and maintain. Less code is better. Less code is good. Uh, and that is that is with, with Axios, there's less custom code that you have to write. I think that's a pro. The other thing is there are 36 million weekly downloads of Axios on NPM. Um, now, again, you could say that uh, this is just CI installs or developers installing this, but this is a really good indicator of how many people are actually using it. So. To me, that's a vote of confidence that people use this library. There's that many downloads. Um, the other aspect of Axios is that it will work in browsers that do not have Fetch. Now, these days, that's not as much of an issue because uh, pretty much every modern browser supports Fetch. But if for whatever reason you need to support IE6, uh, Axios would, would work for you. Um, the other thing is there's lots of extra features in Axios, like HTTP interceptors. You could write... Um, methods that get like basically middlewares that will run anytime a, a, an HTTP request matches uh, your specific interceptor, uh, and also transformers, meaning you can take the response of an HTTP request and transforming it, transform it into something else. And then I showed a quick example of this. You can create a client instance that uses the same base URL for every every request. So there's lots of really cool things that are just built into Axios, which is why I like to use it. Now let's talk about the cons. Um, First of all, it is 10 kilobytes. It's, I think the on, uh, uh, what is this, bundle phobia, it says that uh, Axios, when it's gzipped, is 9.6 kilobytes. Um, so when you add Axios, you're adding 10 kilobytes of data to your page load. Um, 
So that that's a thing. Um, the other thing is this is just another dependency to be managed. Now, if you the, the more you work in code bases and the larger your code bases you get, uh, you know that dependency management is not the easiest thing to do because Axios might have bugs or vulnerabilities, and you want to make sure you're on the latest version when those things get fixed, and you have to manage that and make sure you stay up to date. Uh, and then the other thing is it's it's a non-standard API. Like Axios is a custom library, and um, you have to read its documentation to know how to use it. It's not something that is like universally supported or uh, it's not using any kind of universal standard. So that's Axios. Ultimately, I like it because I, I get to write less code. It handles all the errors and handling and content type negotiation for me. That's why I like Axios. Now, to talk about Fetch, uh, some pros of it are that it's built into most browsers and JavaScript environments. So you can pretty much just start using Fetch. Uh, you don't have to install anything. It just works. Um, and again, that's just no extra dependency to manage. However, that is extra code to manage because uh, ultimately, uh, most code bases I've seen that use fetch, they just have their own little uh, utility function that does all of this. It does the content type negotiation, it does the error handling, and then they have to write all of that code and then use that throughout their code base. Most people aren't using bare fetch throughout their code base. They're using like a, a wrapper function that uh, abstracts away all of the content type stuff and parsing and, and all of that stuff. Um, so, uh, yeah, that's a, you basically, yeah, that's like, and that's a good point, Hasno. You basically end up writing your own Axios if you use Fetch. Um, and so, uh, those the, some other cons I basically already mentioned, but you have to manually handle the HTTP status codes. You're you're over here manually looking at the response object. Um, you have to manually potentially inspect the content type header. Um, manually parse the body, uh, and then the TypeScript support is min minimal. Like technically, if you wanted to give this thing a type, you could cast it. Like you could say like, as my type, um, but that's a little clunky. It, by default, it doesn't have any sort of like TypeScript generics. So I think that's all I wanted to talk about. Basically the, the pros and cons of Axios versus Fetch. I also gave you a quick history lesson. And then there's some other things you can look into. So Redaxios is pretty cool. And I think it is the answer to this debate of like what, what, what you should use because Redaxios has the exact same API as Axios, but it's built on top of Fetch. So basically somebody already did the hard work of uh, handling content type and parsing built it on top of fetch and it's only 800 bytes. So this is something to look into. I would say the, the main issue I had with this is they don't have the same TypeScript support as the bare Axios library, but that's something that could be updated. Uh, and then there's some other HTTP request libraries that have gotten pretty popular. Got is one of them. Personally, I haven't gotten used, used to uh, how uh, Got works. <laughs> like I've tried using it, but it's just so different than what I'm used to. Like. Like the, ha the fact that you have to pass in a JSON property to say that this is like the body of the request, to me, that's that's clunky. Like I just want to pass that in as an argument. I don't want to have to specify that it's JSON. I get that by doing this, they now will automatically set um, the content type header for you. But again, Axios does that by default. It'll basically, I mean, all of my examples have only been a dot .get. But the same thing applies with a dot post. Like if I if I do a dot post to some URL, the second argument here is um, the, the the payload password like this. <laughs> so this is the payload. But behind the scenes, Axios is is able to say, oh, you're giving me an object. I'm going to set the content type of the request to be application JSON because I see that you've given me a JSON object. Uh, whereas with got, you have to give it a, a JSON property. So. Um, yeah, there's got, and then there's a, there's a one, there's a one called request that was pretty popular for a while, but it's now deprecated. Um, and it still has 15 million weekly downloads, but you pretty much don't want to use requests because it's, it's been deprecated in, uh, in 2020. Um, did I have anything else in there? Yeah. Kai is another, another, uh, another one to check out as well. Um, I didn't get got, <laughs> um, yeah, so Kai yeah, it shows you, uh, if you want to make a post request, looks like this. It looks a little bit similar to got in that they have like that JSON property and stuff like that. Um, uh, but again, in their example, they're showing you, well, if you were to use fetch, it gets much more complicated. And I guess that's the other thing. I'm only showing 
Git requests. Post requests, delete requests, anything more complex than a Git requires a whole lot more configuration as well with Fetch, which is why I prefer Axios as well. Cool. So uh, that was my rant on that. Uh, honestly, make your own decision. Like you can weigh the pros and cons yourself. Maybe you can write your own HTTP library and publish it. Um, but thank you for watching. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> That's all I got to say. Come watch on Twitch. There's a bunch of people hanging out here watching. So, yeah. Bye. Everybody say bye, YouTube. Who? Cool. cool. Um, and welcome in. Sorry sorry to just talk over the raid, but welcome in, Raiders. Glad to have you. Thank you again, Anthony Rides Code. Did we get a shout out for Anthony? Um, if we didn't, you're getting another one. There you go. Click that follow. <laughs> um, and also, did we see what they were working on? Open source Python. Cool. I'm guessing it had something to do with configuration. <laughs> uh, but welcome in, Raiders. Uh, for everybody that stuck around, appreciate you. Am I trying to make Fetch happen? No, I'm trying to convince people that Fetch is too much work. <laughs> yeah. Um, Redaxios. Yeah, so Redaxios is interesting, but like I said, it doesn't have the best uh, TypeScript support. Um, how does HTTP versus HTTPS look code-wise? So in terms of making the request, it's no different. Like at, from the client perspective, you just change the URL. From the server side perspective, that that's a whole that's a huge conversation because it's about like how are you how do you set up uh, uh, a certificate? Uh, are you using a reverse proxy? Uh, it gets more complicated. But from the client side, just the URL is the only thing that changes. Yeah. I do believe Axios adds application JSON. Axios mimics request API. I guess probably it mimics a request promise because requests, I mean, I, I remember having to use request for a while, but it has a callback interface. And then someone created request promise, which gave it a, I think this one got deprecated too. It's hard to find. Um, which gave it a promise API. Yeah, deprecated. Um, Yeah, it, it does look like they, they mimic that uh, mimic that API quite a bit. So that's cool. How does one make a site HTTPS? I see. That's a bit more complicated. Um, I would you you should look into uh, Let's Encrypt, which is um, they're not. I was gonna say they're an organization. They're by the Electronic Frontier Foundation. Foundation. Um, they're a certificate authority. That's what I should call them. <laughs> but you can get free SSL certificates from them. But it'll it'll vary wildly depending on um, depending on um, how your website is deployed. Because uh, if you have your own like virtual private server, then there's a, a Python certbot package that will automatically provision certificates for you. But if you're using some other uh, uh, self host or a hosting provider, then it's going to depend on how they allow you to set your certificates. But yeah. Yeah, I think so too. Also clutch, but I, I think if you look at the history of it and like, and you look at, so we showed an example with XML HTTP requests and I, I didn't realize this cause I mean, it was so long ago that I used XML HTTP requests, but you, you still had to manually parse and you still had to look at the status code. Uh, so I think fetch was just an easier version of this with nothing more. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> I've convinced you to check it out. Cool. No, I, I, I have to head out. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I gotta, I gotta head out. Um, Though, I do appreciate all the questions that I got asked today. And again, if you asked a question that I wasn't able to answer, um, check out our Discord. We have a help forum. So if you have any code-related questions, we're happy to try and answer there. Um, I don't have any plans, Hasno, ha Hasno, but I want to. I want to because um, I've been wanting to check out Nux, but... It was in release candidate for the longest time. Honestly, we could try to do like a simple version of fresh spots with Nuxt. That could be interesting. I don't know. I want to do some research beforehand, but 
Yeah, we definitely have some. I want to do a project pretty soon that uses Nuxt. That'll be fun. Yeah. No, yeah, Nuxt 3 got released today. Today. It's stable today. Let's see if their website got fixed. No, they still haven't fixed that link. <laughs> uh, but announcing today. Today. No, I haven't used Kotlin like on stream before. I, I've I've tested it out, but uh, uh, I, like built like a basic Android app with it. But I've never done anything with it on stream. Okay, um, hopefully that'll be a decent YouTube video. I don't know. I don't know. But what's up, Antonio? Welcome in. Um. Cool, cool. I'm definitely going to push this code to code to GitHub, but I'm going to head out. Um, I will be streaming tomorrow. Well, welcome in, Antonio. Yeah, we got lots of beginners here as well. So you are um, you're very welcome here. <laughs> but I'll be streaming tomorrow. Um, there we go. <laughs> um we can take a quick stretch before we go. I'll be streaming tomorrow. We're going to be wrapping up a um, a project that we've been working on for like the past three months. It's not, it's by no means is it done, but we're going to tr attempt to transition it into a community project because there's a lot of people in the community that want to get experience uh, collaborating on GitHub and working in a larger code base. So uh, this app, we're going to, this is going to be our experiment for that. Uh, in that I, I am the tech lead, <laughs> the, the project manager that will be in charge of like merging the pull requests, but we will be accepting pull requests from the community. It's, it's not quite, uh, ready yet because all of the issues are on Trello and the code is, uh, it's all over the place, but tomorrow I'm going to do my best to like wrap things up and make it a place where people can contribute and like basically practice contributing uh, to open source projects. Uh, we're going to work on that tomorrow. If you go to this this page, you can see my schedule. It should show it in your time zone. Uh, but that's it. Thanks again to Anthony Rides Code for the raid. I'm sorry to just send you all somewhere else really soon. Um, but uh, I'll send you I'll send you somewhere good. We'll find we'll find a coder to go raid. Um, so here we go. If you are a sub, you can use uh, that raid message. I think. Yeah, there we go. Uh, if you're not a sub, you can use this raid message. Also, feel free to come up with an Anthony Wright's code raid message as well. <laughs> no! RW I'm literally on the way out, RWX Rob. I'm literally on the way out. But thank you for the raid. I really appreciate it. What, here, let's see. What were you working on? You heard this is the channel to raid? Abstract syntax tree in Go. That sounds fun. Hey. Hey, I feel so bad leaving. I gotta go though. I have to eat dinner. <laughs> I'm so sorry. Uh, thank you for the raid, R R RWX Rob. Um, we don't have a shout out going right now, do we? We don't. Click that link. How am I not following you? That's insane. But click that link, drop a follow. Uh, raid train. I'm gonna send you to, to, some, to, to another coder. Um, Thank you for bringing your friends over, but I got to go. I got to go. Um, all right. Uh, I'll be live tomorrow, though, if you want to tune in. <laughs> uh, check out the schedule there. Uh, I mentioned we're, we're going to be working on transitioning uh, this project, which we've been working on stream for like two and a half months now. But we're going to transition it so that it's easier for people to contribute to. Um, and... I'll be the project manager gatekeeper that like does PRs and stuff like that. So cool. Cool, 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 cool. All right, I got to go. Thank you again for that raid. Uh, definitely click the link, drop a follow. But uh, wherever you are in the world, have a wonderful morning, afternoon, evening, or night. And until next time, here's this.